a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first with premium quality and best for you. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. You get a call from a man telling you that a woman has been badly beaten. Before you can get the name of the victim or any other information, the caller hangs up. Your job? Investigate. Here is Chesterfield's record with smokers, and important to you. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report of a doctor who has been examining a group of Chesterfield smokers for a full year and two months as a part of a program supervised by a responsible independent research laboratory. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality. Chesterfield. First choice of young America. And that's from a survey made in 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Chesterfield, regular or king size. They're much milder and best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Friday, June 10th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the main jail, and it was 8.10 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Frank? Yeah? Wait a minute. I want to talk to you. I'm not going any place. Oh. Well, I talked to Evans. I couldn't get any more out of him. The arraignment's still set for the 14th, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. But can't you settle down for a minute and stop that pacing up and down? What's the matter? Something on your mind? On my leg. Oh, something wrong with it? Not a thing. Just walking. Well, I wish you could manage to stand still for a minute. I'm getting a little bilious following you around the room. You know how far it is from here to the business office? What do you mean? How far? Oh, it's just across the hall. Is that what you mean? 25 feet? No, you're wrong. It's one two hundred and tenth of a mile. Well, that's good to know. It's one sixth of a mile to the crime lab, including the stairs. An eighth of a mile to Sal's Cafe. Four trips to R&I equals a quarter of a mile. Ever knew that, did you? No. Our grand total tonight so far is over six miles, and we're only half through. What do you think of that, Joe? Well, what's it all through? Well, this is a walking job we got. Well, everybody knows that, don't they? Yeah, but I'm the only one in the department who knows exactly how far we walk. That's fine. Any calls come in while I was out? No. Like to know how I do it? What's that? It's done with a pedometer. Measures miles. Just fasten it on your leg, see? At the end of the day, you know exactly how far you walk. Yeah. Gonna measure everything, Joe. Keep track. Gonna know exactly how far everything is. What for? Somebody might want to know. Who? I get it. Homicide Friday. Yeah. Now, what's that address again? Yeah. Right. Now we got one to roll on. What do you got? Ambulance follow-up, Westlake area. Yeah. Woman's been beaten. 8.14 p.m. We left the city hall and drove to the address we'd been given. 8674 Cambria Street was a large private home that had been divided into apartments. The house was quiet and there was no sign of any disturbance. There was a woman sitting in a glider on the front porch. We went up and talked to her. Something I can do for you? Police officers, ma'am. We got a call that there'd been some sort of trouble here. What kind of trouble? 
The woman had been beaten. Is that right? It must be some kind of joke. Nothing like that here. You sure you got the right address? The one we were given, ma'am. You got an apartment 104? Yeah, the last one back on the left. Rockman's live there, Mr. and Mrs. We'd like to see the apartment. Go ahead. Anything happened around here, I'd know about it. I'm the landlady. Anything happened, I'd know about it. Go ahead, you won't find anything. Thank you very much, ma'am. Here it is. I'll get it. Better try the door, huh? Yeah. Nobody here. It looks like they had a party, huh? I'll yeah. check the back. No? No one out there. Coffee on the table's cold. You find anything? Where's that door go, ma'am? Bedroom. Joe, it's a girl on the bed. No. Yeah, I really worked her over, huh? How about it? Let's see if I can find her pulse here. Yeah, she's still alive. Uh, what is it? Something happened to Hazel? Joe, it's pretty bad. Both eyes black, bleeding. Is this Mrs. Rockman here? Yeah, it's Hazel. What's wrong? Where's her husband? I don't know. When'd you see him last? Well, about five minutes ago. Where was that? On the front porch. He just walked out. <laughs> The ambulance crew arrived and immediately removed the victim to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital for emergency treatment. We got in touch with Officer Ed Barrett of the hospital detail and asked him to try to get a statement from the victim if she regained consciousness. We locked the door to the Rockman apartment to preserve any physical evidence we might need, and then we went down and talked to the landlady, Mrs. Ruth Baker. We found her on the front porch. We asked her what she knew about what had happened. I sure wish I could tell you more. How about Hazel? Is she going to be all right? We don't know yet, Miss Baker. She's pretty badly beaten. Mm-hmm. What do you want from me? Some questions we'd like to ask, ma'am. About what? I told you what I know. Do you know where Mrs. Rockman's husband was going? No, I don't. I don't much care either. Did you see anything at all when he went out? Not a word. Just walked out in a sort of daze, like a trance sort of. He didn't say anything at all to you? I just got through telling you that he didn't. Yes, ma'am. Mr. and Ms. Rockman fight often, would you know? No, not any more than any married couple. Miss Baker... Yeah? wonder if you can give us a description of Mr. Rockman. Description? Yes, ma'am. Tell us what he looks like. You figure he did that to Hazel, huh? That's what we want to talk to him about. What kind of description do you want? About how tall is he? About as tall as he is? That'd be 5'10", huh? If that's what you are. How much would you say weighed... Wouldn't even make a guess. I don't notice things like that. Yes, ma'am, but would you say it was medium build or heavy? I'd say medium. Not too heavy, not too skinny. Medium. What color is his hair? Black. How about his eyes? Brown. Real dark brown. You wear glasses? No. Was he clean shaven? What do you mean? Well, do you have a mustache? No, he had one a while ago. He tried to grow one, but Hazel made him take it off. It never grew real well. A little scraggly thing. What was he wearing when you saw him last? Shirt and pants. Could you tell us what color the shirt was? No, and I can't tell you what color the pants were either. It's dark out here. I didn't pay much attention when he left. Just thought he didn't feel well. Sick from the party. All right, Miss Baker. May I use your phone? Sure, help yourself. It's in the living room, right inside the door to your left. You can't miss it. All right, ma'am. Thanks. I'll call this in, Joe. All right. You know, Miss Baker? Yeah? Does Mr. Rockman drink much? Why do you ask that? Well, I wonder if there might be some bar in the neighborhood that he might have gone to, maybe. No, he doesn't drink much at all. Once in a while, he and Hazel have a glass of wine before dinner. You know, sharpen the appetite, just a glass of wine before dinner. Mm -hmm. And you haven't any idea where he might have gone? Not the slightest. Does he have any relatives in the city? I can't answer that. You mean you don't know? Must have some people someplace. Most of us do. But I'm not the kind of person who pries into the private lives of my tenants. They pay their rent, no loud parties, and I don't bother them. How about this party tonight? Yeah, what about it? Was there any trouble? Not that I knew about. You didn't hear anything? Any loud talking? Any arguments, maybe? Nope, I wasn't at the party. Wasn't invited. Hazel gave it for her Tony friends. Gonna play bridge. I wasn't there. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us who was there? Never been able to get the hang of the game. Don't like cards. 
Chinese checkers, that's my game. Never could understand bridge, so I wasn't invited. Well, can't you give us a list of the people who were there? I suppose. Why do you need it? We'd like to talk to them. Well, I guess it'd be all right to give them to you. How's Hazel? You heard yet? No, ma'am. Sure a terrible thing. Not that maybe she didn't deserve it, but it's sure terrible. Why do you say that, Miss Baker? What do you mean, why do I say it? I say it because it's true. No other reason to say something. Yes, ma'am, but what do you mean? Just that it was bound to happen. Somebody was bound to haul off and slap her mouth shut one of these days, the way she talked. Ma'am? Accusing. Always accusing. Thought everybody in the world was after her. Always tell me that she knew about me, that I wasn't fooling anybody. The words she'd use. And they're supposed to be so tony. Well, did she have any enemies around her? Anyone to make her think that, would you know? Well, she didn't have any right-out enemies. There were several people who didn't like her. They thought she was too snooty for them. I'd call the office, Joe. They're putting out a broadcast. Did you check him? Yeah, nothing on him. Mm -hmm. Hope it's all right, ma'am. I left your number in case they want to reach us. Sure, it's all right. Can you give us the names of the people who were at the party tonight, ma'am? Yeah, there was Lily Davis, the Harrises, and there was some fellow with Lily that I never saw before. You know where you can get in touch with him, do you? Well, the Harrises live up in 203, and Lily has an apartment 105 right across from the Rockmans. She ought to be able to tell you something. Don't know if it's going to be the truth, but she'll think of something to tell you. Yes, ma'am. Is she a good friend of Mrs. Rockman's, do you know? Oh, you bet. They're thick as thieves. Always having little lunches by themselves, talking secrets, buzzing around. Thieves. Myself, I never took to Lily. I always thought she was kind of wild. Divorcee, you know. All right, Miss Baker, thank you very much. We'll be in 105 if there are any calls. Appreciate it if you let us know. If Mr. Rockman comes in, don't mention to him that we're here. Mm-hmm. All right. That was 105, you said? Yeah. Better talk to this Davis woman, huh? Yeah. Maybe she can tell us where Rockman is. Yeah. 105. Here it is, sir. Yes? Miss Davis? Yes. Is there something I can do for you? Yes, ma'am. We're police officers. Well, what is it you want with me? We'd like to talk to you, ma'am. Oh, well, come in. Thank you. I wonder if it'd be all right if we left the door open. I suppose so. Any special reason? Well, we'd like to keep an eye on the apartment across the hall. Well, what's it about? We understand that you know the Rockmans pretty well. I suppose so. Why? Do you have any idea where Mr. Rockman might be? No, I don't. Isn't he across the hall? No, ma'am, he isn't. Well, I don't know where he is. Have you talked to Hazel? No, ma'am. Well, why don't you ask her? She should know. Well, we were wondering if you could help us out. No, last I saw of him was when he left their place. Uh-huh. Say, I wonder if you'd mind if I went ahead with what I was doing. Ma'am? <laughs> Probably seems silly to you, but it's a hobby of mine. Wire sculpture. Silly, but it gives me a chance to relax. Yes, ma'am. Will you go right ahead? I don't think I got your names. Well, my name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do, Mr. How do you Smith? do, ma'am? Mr. Friday. Well, what's all this about? Herman done something wrong? No, it's just a routine investigation, Miss Davis. Oh, mm-hmm. I understand that you were at their place tonight, a party, huh? Well, yes. Hazel was going to have a couple of tables of bridge. Anything unusual happen while you were there? No, nothing that you'd call really unusual. Who was there, ma'am? Oh, myself, the Harrises, they live upstairs, and Tom Reeves. Another couple were coming over after dinner, but they called and said they couldn't make it. It's just as well. None of us felt much like playing. Why was that? Well, Hazel wasn't feeling very well. She and Herman had a little argument. You know how it is, kind of uncomfortable. Excuse me. Hello? Yes. Oh, yes, Tom. No. Well, you've got to understand she wasn't feeling too well. Mm-hmm. Just one of those things. Yeah. What? No, I've got a meeting that I want to go to tomorrow night. Modern art, yes. At a place down on Melrose. Well, sure, if you if you want to. Mm-hmm. All right. You want to pick me up about seven? Right. Okay. See you then. Bye. Excuse me, that was Tom. He's a nice boy. I just met him tonight. The Rockmans set it up. Mm -hmm. What was this argument that the Rockmans had? Do you know what that was about? Well, it was nothing, just a little thing. Hazel hadn't been feeling well lately. It's awfully easy to set her off. I guess sometimes Herman doesn't realize it. Yes, ma'am, but what caused it tonight? Well, you see, Hazel's been thinking that there was somebody been following her, spying on her. She told Herman about it tonight. That made him a little angry. And, well, then at dinner we just sat down. Mrs. Harris said that she'd seen a picture of the dress that Hazel had on in the morning paper. Well... Hazel didn't understand. I guess she thought that Mrs. Harris was being nasty about it. And 
She got up and left the table, went into the bedroom. Yes, ma'am. Herman got up and went in after her. Came out and said that she wasn't feeling well. Kind of threw a damper on the evening, so when the other couple called and said that they wouldn't be able to make it, we all decided to call it quits. Mm -hmm. Was there any reason for Mrs. Rockman to feel that there was somebody spying on her? Oh, no, Mr. Friday. It was just one of those things. She'd go along fine, feel good, and then she'd wake up in the morning and start to think about things, and she'd get depressed. Well, when she's like that, there isn't anything that can lift her out of it. We used to talk about it. I'd try to help her. Same thing happened to me, I know. It's just one of those things. That's right. Maybe if they'd had children, it'd be different, but... Lately, she hasn't been feeling well, and she and Herman haven't been getting along. He just didn't seem to understand. She'd get angry, and he'd work late. And the more he worked late and stayed away from home, the more she'd fret and get angry. It's just a vicious circle. Nothing anyone can do about it. It'll pass with time. Mm -hmm. When Rockman went in to see his wife, did they argue? Well, they had a few words, a little loud, nothing serious. Then he came out and said that everything was all right. Well, ma'am, did Rockman ever get violent toward his wife, do you know? What do you mean, violent? He ever hit her? No, I don't think so. A couple of times when I was over there, he looked like he might be thinking of it, but I never saw it. I think if he ever did hit her, Hazel would have told me. We were very close, as I said. I tried to help her. Mm -hmm. Just a few loud words. That's all I ever knew about. Anyway, after Herman came out of the bedroom, we all decided to leave. This fellow Tom, he wanted to go on, you know, out someplace, but I was a little tired, and I'd just met him tonight, so I begged off and came home. Yes, ma'am. Can't you tell me what this is all about? Miss Davis? Hello, Mrs. Baker. Something you want? I want to see the police. Mr. Smith, your office called, said you were to call this number right away. Here's the number they gave me. They said you'd know I wrote it down. Thank you, ma'am. Here, you want to call, Joe? Yeah. What if I use your phone, Miss Davis? Well, sure, help yourself. Thank you. Isn't this the most awful thing you've heard in all your life? What? What about Herman? What he did? Terrible. They ought to send him away for a long time. A good long Dr. time. Dr. Hall, please. What are you talking about? All the ambulances, the police. Never had a thing like this happen before. All the excitement. And what Herman did. Just terrible. That's all terrible. Mr. Baker, would you wait just a minute, please? Well, somebody tell me what this is all Hello, about. Oh, Dr. Hall, this is Joe Friday. Yeah. Now, we're here now. She is. You're sure about that, right? Yeah, well, he does, right? No, we'll call him right now. Yes, it does. Right. Bye. It's Georgia Street. Yeah. Ms. Rockman died. It was something else. What? She wasn't beaten. She was shot to death. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of all cigarettes. Chesterfield quality is highest. Here's the proof. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality, highest. 15% higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality, highest. 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield, first with premium quality and best for you. Try Chesterfield today, regular or king size. <laughs> Nine ten p.m. We called the crime lab and Ray Pinker and a crew were sent out to check the physical evidence at the scene. We contacted Ed Barrett at the hospital, but he said the woman had not regained consciousness. Frank and I went upstairs to talk with Mr. and Mrs. Harris. They gave us substantially the same story we'd gotten from Lily Davis. They agreed that when Rockman went into the bedroom to see his wife, they'd heard loud voices but nothing else. They stated positively that as far as they knew, there'd been no shot fired while they were in the Rockman apartment. 9.17 p.m., we checked with the other people in the apartment building. None of them could report having heard a shot. From them, we got the same story of Mrs. Rockman's actions. Some of the neighbors said that they didn't get along with her. Others seemed to understand her feelings. 9.22 p.m., we checked back with Ray Pinker and the crew from the crime lab. 
We didn't spend a lot of time here, Ray. The husband looked good for it. We were trying to round him up. Shooting was a real surprise, huh? Looks like a beating to us. We couldn't tell. The boys from Georgia Street got her out of here right away. Yeah. Did you come up with anything, Ray? Yeah, a couple things. How you fellas got it figured? Well, talking to the neighbors, looks like the husband does. Talked to him? No, he walked right out after it happened. Got out a broadcast on him. Nothing's turned up yet, though. Mm-hmm. How's it look to you, Ray? Well, I'm not sure I can go along with you guys and the husband. Well? I talked to Doc Hall. We aren't going to be able to know for sure till they post the body. Woman is slapped around, we know that. Yeah, we saw her. It looked pretty brutal to us. You mean the black eyes? Yeah. From what Doc Hall says, that didn't come from beating. He says the bullet did it. Was he pretty sure about it? it looks like it. Autopsy will prove it. Where'd you find the gun? Under the bed. Over here, right side. Mm-hmm. Indentation on the floor here. Evidently fell from her hand, bounced back under the bed. Any prints on it? Lifted three clean ones. You been able to make them? Lifted some from the dressing table over there. Perfume bottles, mirror. Looks like they might belong to the dead woman. Check them for sure later. And you figure maybe she did herself then, huh? Well, it's beginning to shape up. Well, how about the shot, Ray? Nobody we've talked to heard it. Here's the explanation for that. This pillow here. See the bullet hole here? Burn? Yeah. Doc Hall says she was shot in the back of the right ear. She must have held the gun in the pillow. That muffled the sound. What noise there was wouldn't be heard very far. Well, how can you be sure it was suicide, Ray? Just an idea now. We roll the dead woman's prints, run a blotter test on her, see if she fired the gun. Check for nitrate, we'll know for sure. Well, how long will that take? I'll be finished in an hour or so. I'll let you know then. From where I sit, though, it looks like she did it herself. Yeah. I still don't understand about the black eyes, though. The way I get it, the bullet entered just behind the right ear. Passed behind the eyes. I've seen it a couple of times before. Yeah, but Doc Hall said that she'd been slapped a couple of times, right? Yeah. Said he found a couple of bruises on her cheeks. Not enough to do any damage, though. Sure not enough to kill her. Mr. Friday? Mr. Friday? Yes, ma'am. Can you come right over to my place? Herman's on the phone. What's that? Mr. Rockman. He called to find out how Hazel was. All right. Phone's right there. Thank you. Hello? 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 He's not there now. What'd he say? Well, he asked me if I knew how Hazel was. I told him that she was dead, and then I asked him where he was. Did he tell you? No. He just said for me to tell people that he was sorry he did it, for me to tell them that, that he didn't mean it. Mm-hmm. He said he didn't mean to kill Hazel. Well, the way it looks, he didn't do it. Then you'd better find him right away. Well? Yeah. He thinks he did, and he's going to kill himself. We talked to the landlady, Ruth Baker, but she was unable to tell us where Herman Rockman was employed. Lily Davis told us that he was a car salesman employed at a lot in the south end of town. We asked Miss Davis to stay by our phone in the event that Rockman called back and to let us know immediately if he did. We found an address book in the desk in the living room of the apartment and we began to call Rockman's friends and relatives. None of them had seen him or could tell us where he worked. 9.45 p.m. It had been 20 minutes since the husband of the dead woman had called and said that he was going to kill himself. At 9.46 p.m., we contacted the brother-in-law of the dead woman, and he told us that as far as he knew, Rockman had been employed by the Bateman Auto Agency in Gardena. We got the number from information, and I put in the call. Hello, is this the Bateman Auto Agency? Well, this is Sergeant Joe Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. Yes, sir. Do you have a Herman Rockman working for you? Yes, sir, that's right. R-O-C-K-M... Uh-huh. I see. When was that? Yeah. You any idea where he's working now? Uh-huh. Yes, sir, I understand. Yeah, well, have you got the number? Fine, yeah. Would you know if they're open this time of night? I see. Okay, all right, sure, I'll hold on. How about it? Says Rockman did work for him. He hasn't seen him in a couple of... Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's 03, right? Yes, sir, thanks very much. Says he's heard Rockman's working for a company out on Washington Boulevard now. Huh. Left him a couple of weeks ago. Hello. Do you have a Herman Rockman working there? Hello. Hello. Somebody answered. As soon as I asked about Rockman, he hung up. Think it was him? There's no way of telling him. We better check on it quick. You got the address? Yeah, it ought to take us about five minutes to get there. Let's go. We still got a chance. Nine fifty PM. We left the apartment and we drove out West Lake Avenue and turned down to Washington Boulevard. We traveled Code 3, but because of the possibility of alarming Rockman, we turned off the sirens six blocks from the address of the used car lot. 9.54 p.m. We got to the place. The lot was dark. At the rear and back of a line of cars, we could see a small shack. I hope he's here. Yeah. There's no lights on. The door's locked. Let's try the side. There's a window around there. Right. Can you see anything? No, the window's dirty. Got your flashlight? Yeah. Here you go. Give me... How about it? He's in there. Looks like he's out. Come on. 
Let's hit it. Right. Pull the gas. Kill your flashlight. Right. I'll get him out of here. You want to get that heater? Right. The window's stuck. Break it. How about it? He's still alive. Fresh air should bring him out. Yeah. Rockman. Rockman. Come on, Rockman. You're all right. Sit up. Why'd you do it? Why'd you stop me? No reason for you to kill yourself. I got a reason. I killed Hazel. I didn't mean to. I loved him more than anything. I, I didn't mean it. I didn't know I hit her that hard. Oh, yeah. Settle down. Settle down. You didn't kill her, Rockman. Nobody asked you to come down here. I called you to take care of her. I, I knew it was too late. I killed her. She's dead and it's my fault. Why'd you come here? Why'd you stop me? All right, now take it easy, will you, Rockman? Straighten yourself out here. You didn't kill your wife, Rockman. You understand? What? We don't think you killed her. We think she did it herself. Huh? Oh. Well, she wasn't well. She was sick. She, she didn't know what she was doing. She did the wrong thing, didn't she? Her way wasn't right. I loved you, you know, very much. Yes, sir, we understand. Doesn't really make any difference. You stop me. No difference. Sir? Doesn't make any difference that you stop me. I loved you. No difference at all. How's that? I died with her. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 15th, an inquest was held in the coroner's office in and for the county of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that inquest. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, next Sunday, June 21st, is Father's Day. Your neighborhood dealer has the special Chesterfield Father's Day carton on sale right now. So remember the guy who never forgets you. Don't give him just any cigarette. Give him premium quality Chesterfields. Regular or king size, they're best for him. At the coroner's inquest, it was decided that the wound that killed Hazel Eileen Rockman was self-inflicted. The death was listed as a suicide. Her husband, Herman George Rockman, was not held. <laughs> have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, June Whitley, Lillian Byatt. Script by John Robinson, Ben Alexander. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfields. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork-tipped Fatima? It's the smooth smoke. Here's why. New Fatima tips of perfect cork, king size for longer filtering, and Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, Fatima has the tip for your lips. Try new Fatima. See how smooth it is. Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. <laughs>
My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lyon. Anthony J. Lyon. I'm the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, investigators stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Diamond Quartet. Well, this is the way it started. Melody called about 6 o'clock that night. She gave me the name of a restaurant out on the strip and said that Lion was waiting for me. I drove out there and found him squatting at one of the corner tables. He had a big white napkin tucked under all of his chins, and he was working on a plate of crab louis and a bottle of beer. A tall peroxide blonde in slacks and dark glasses was sitting across from him, watching him eat. And a couple of bald-headed waiters were just sort of standing around looking at the ceiling. Well, well, Regan, I see you got my message. You're out on time. Sit down, sit down. I want you to meet Miss, um... What did you say your name was, young lady? Madge will do. Just plain Madge, fatso. Mm, uh, Regan, this is Madge. I hate gumshoes. They all stink. Okay, where'd you find her? Madge? Oh, um, Madge works for Mr. Daly, Mr. Pete Daly. He's a new client of ours. Isn't that right, uh, Madge? Oh, gumshoes are nosy. That's why I don't like them. Madge is going to drive you out to Mr. Daly's residence, Regan. Who's Daly? Very nice chap. Very nice chap. I spoke with him on the phone. Mm -hmm. What's the job? Well, it's a rather delicate matter, and I think Mr. Daly himself can explain it better than I. Come on, all this gas ain't getting us nowhere. The boss is waiting. Gumshoes talk too much. Uh, Yes, Regan, yes. I told Mr. Daly you'd be there by 7 o'clock. You just run along with Madge here and see what it's all about. That's it. Uh, nice to have met you, Mad. Ah, dry up, Fatso. Yeah, go on, go on. Um, uh, call me, Regan. Call me if you're running any trouble. Just plain Madge, who was carrying a twenty-five automatic in her purse. When we got into a Cadillac, we went out the pass, turned off a hill and back of Burbank. Daly's residence was... At the end of a private road, a nice old southern-style place with two or three private patrolmen guarding the entrance. They all needed shade. They kind of nodded when we got out of the car and went up to the front door. Naturally, there was a peep shutter there. It was real southern. Yes? Yeah? Me, Felix. This is the private keeper the boss wants to see. Okay, me. Come on this way. Who is it? Madge, I got your peeper. Inside. Here he is, Pete. Flat feet and all. His name's Regan. Okay, Madge, that's all. Beat it. Um, sit down, Regan, sit down. Don't mind Madge. She's kind of antisocial. Nice place you got. How's the gross? Yeah, you know, I do all right. Two crab tables, two faro games, a little roulette in the living room, but I have to be careful. I noticed that driving up. There's lots of money thrown around here every night. Somebody might get some ideas. You know how it is. What about the law? Law? <laughs> no trouble with them. I just don't let them know I'm in operation. Mm-hmm. In my business, I haven't much use for private detectives. I don't generally like them. Neither does Madge. But I happen to need one right now. I want you to do a little job for me. You seem to have plenty of help around here. Wasn't that Felix Frazier at the door there? Last time I saw him, he was shadowing a banker up in Sacramento. Yes, that was Felix, all right. But uh, it's a little different. Now, never seen this before? No? Well, it's a little bit of necklace called the Diamond Quartet. It's worth quite a chunk of cash. These four diamonds are good stuff. So? Dame named Annabella Callender left it here a week ago. She was in kind of deep at the roulette table and was wearing this. She left it for security. How much did she lose? About five Gs, I guess. Kind of screwy little dame. She's a widow with a lot of money and a boyfriend named Teddy Silco. He paints or something. They come here. And she loses steady. Every time. (laughs) Well, she sent me a check today for the full amount of what she lost. Yeah? And uh, I want you to take this thing back to her tonight. That it? That's it. 
Now, I got my dough. She gets her little diamond necklace back. Just business. Well, that sounds simple. It's simple. You're a licensed investigator, bonded, and insured. Don't want any fuss about this. You just take it back. Very simple. Okay. Now, you told me how simple it all is. Suppose you give me the hook. Did her check bounce? You, uh, want a drink? There wasn't any check. I thought it'd be something like that. Yeah. She called me a couple hours ago, said if I didn't have this thing back by tonight, she'd call a load of cops and come out and get it. Not such a dumb dame as that. As you're telling me. <clears throat> if she comes here with cops, I'm closed for the season, and this dump cost me a pile of dough. Felix was running the roulette table that night. I didn't know he'd taken this as security until we counted up. I should have pushed his mush in or something, letting a dame like that make a setup. Yeah, maybe you'll do better next time. Ain't gonna be no next time, Reagan. Here's her address. Here's the ice. Just take it to her and I'll chalk it up to experience. You better get yourself a new boy at that table. Yes, you're telling me. You're telling me. Well, I took a taxi over to the restaurant in Hollywood, picked up my Buick, and drove to an apartment house near Pico and Beverly Drive. A couple of men in a little gray coupe were sitting in front of the building smoking cigarettes and pulling on their hat brims. I figured Daly was making sure I got the right address. Upstairs on the fifth floor, I leaned into the buzzer and waited to see what Mrs. Annabella Callender looked like. Oh, Teddy, I thought you'd never get here. The performance begins at 8.15 and you know the traffic. Uh, oh, you aren't there. You Annabella Callender? Of course. Who are you? My name's Regan. Oh, Miss Regan. Well, I'm only waiting for Ted to get here so we can make first check into the Biltmore. We're seeing Carousel and we're going to be late if he doesn't get here. You can understand that. Yeah, it figures. And I- I'm all ready and he hasn't shown up. Well, good night. <laughs> Yeah, her white ermine cape and the black strapless thing needed a touch. But she had it. That necklace I had in my pocket, or a very good copy, was hanging around her neck, and it looked like four Klieg lights at a Hollywood premiere. Hey, 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 lay off, lay off, you busted door, lay off. What's the idea? You want to bust down the door? You drunk or something? I've been pounding on this door for five minutes. Well, that's too bad. Can't you read the signs? This building's close. The scram, drift, push off, blow. Uh, you got a jeweler in this building named Tartaglia? Yeah, we got a jeweler named Tartaglia. Only don't want to see nobody because it's 9 o'clock at night. The joint's closing ain't here. All right, slow down. He lives someplace, don't he? Sure. There's a lot of houses that way. Why don't you try knocking on doors? There wasn't any residence listed in the phone book. I thought maybe if I came down here to his office, you could tell me where I might see him. I ain't going to tell you nothing. Look, I'm a private investigator. I got to see him tonight. Oh, uh... How's little old expense account, Pilgrim? It'll do. Let me see, pal. <coughs> the name's Freddie Leach. Your boy's a fat old pile of blubber with a lot of talk in this note. White Hotel, 208, three blocks, straight ahead. Thanks, Freddie. Anytime, pal. From the store, Buck, I'll tell you where his girlfriend lives. <laughs> Come in, Mr. Regan. Come in, come in. You find me a bit indisposed at this hour. I was preparing to retire, but you said it was a matter of jewelry. Therefore, Bert Tartaglia is at your service. Now, then, sir, what is so urgent? I came to see you about a diamond necklace. I found your name stamped on the inside. House of Tartaglia, most respected name in diamonds as in all the lapidary arts. Most respected. I'm the last of four sons. All... But... Continue, Mr. Regan. Take a look at this. And how do you come into possession of the Diamond Quartet, sir? A man named Daly, who runs a gambling club, hired me to take it back to a lady named Callender. Gambling house? And how did Mr. Daly acquire it? Well, she lost it at the roulette table. She left it so she could raise the cash. Deplorable, deplorable conduct on her part. Annabella Callender, a very indiscreet young lady, to be sure, to be sure. Lovely body, propelled by a ridiculous man. I tried to take it back to her tonight. It's beautiful, isn't it, Mr. Regan? I want to know if it's real or not. Real? Of course it's real. You sure? Mr. Regan, do you doubt my ability as a gemologist? Once in a lifetime, sir, only once in a lifetime, does an artisan have the opportunity to create the perfect necklace. How much will it pull? Priceless in the amount of work. Roughly $65,000. See, here, under the light. 
See how carefully each stone is mounted. Without reservation, I pronounce the Diamond Quartet an incomparable masterpiece. Well, I saw one just like it tonight. Huh? I didn't quite follow you, sir. No one could create another Diamond Quartet except Bert Tartaglia. Well, and somebody made up a pretty good imitation. <laughs> the finest workman at best would create only a crude resemblance. This kind of work demands an artist, Mr. Regan, an artist. But it could get by. Well, uh, uh, to the unpracticed eye, ah, yes. To the layman, perhaps, yes. Mm-hmm. That's all I wanted to know. Later to Nanguas Herber, eh? What was that? Latin. A snake in the grass, eh? Maybe. Your expression tells me you are concerned for the safety of this piece. I have a safe here in my room, if you care. No, it'll be all right. Well, then, you leave satisfied, I trust. Yeah, thanks. Think nothing of it, Mr. Egan. Think nothing of it. Just remember the house of Tartaglia when you want to find your... Good evening, sir. <laughs> In the lobby, I got two three-cent stamps from the clerk. He watched me put the diamond quartet in an envelope, address it to myself, and mail it right there. He blinked a couple of times, but I didn't tell him about my two pals parked across the street in the little gray coop. Well, they were sitting there, still sucking on cigarettes and pulling on their hat brims. When I walked outside, they got out of the coop, came over to where I was lighting a cigarette. The tall one tapped me on the shoulder. Here's the paper, Georgie. Want to ask him for a match? Georgie's near sighted. That's too bad. That's him, Danny. Got a match, Peeper? Georgie asked if you got a match, Peeper. He's a dummy, Georgie. He don't talk. Got a match, Peeper? What I tell you, he's a dummy. He don't look like no dummy. Why, he's a dummy, all right, ain't you, Peeper? See, he's a dummy, Georgie. I told him about you being near side, and he said it was too bad. Didn't you, Peeper? He still don't talk. Go on, Peeper. Tell Georgie how sorry you are about him being near sighted. I told you he was a... I told you he was a dummy, Georgie. I'll privatize like you. Georgie asked you a question. He wants to know if all privatized is like you. Danny boy says you're a dummy. You're a dummy? Georgie asked you another question. He wants to know if you're a dummy. See, he don't answer. I don't like dummies. We asked three questions already, and he ain't said nothing. That makes him a dummy. Maybe we'd find something if we went through the dummy's pockets. Yeah, even a dummy's got pockets. Ain't that right, dummy? Hold it, Georgie. <laughs> Hey, move just like a dummy. What do you want? Hey, talk. Yeah, yeah. Make him talk again, Georgie. Oh. Make him talk bigger, Georgie. Oh. Talk's real nice, but he don't say much. Maybe he's tough, Georgie. He might think he's tough. But then again... Oh. You see? Yeah, it's a tough. Now it's my turn. <laughs> hey. You don't talk no more, Danny. This peeper ain't no pretty picture, Georgie. Why you want to hold him up? You are listening to the story of the Diamond Quartet. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Twenty-nine thousand nurses are needed now to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses are given the opportunity of receiving a commission in the regular Army Reserve. These nurses will remain on inactive status, ready to serve their country in the event of an emergency. Four thousand of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with the nurse's civilian life, but the educational opportunities offered her by the Army Medical Department will be of a great advantage to her in her work. So don't wait. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card now for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of the Diamond Quartet and Jeff Regan, Investigator. <laughs> Nurse, are you sure he's coming too? He had quite a beating, Mr. Lyon, but he's coming around. Regan, Regan. Regan, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Regan, can you hear me? I think he's with us now. Hmm. It's me, Regan. What happened to you? Why didn't you call? 
Regan, do you understand me? Hmm? What's this? That's your head. It isn't very pretty, let me tell you that. I'll be at my desk, Mr. Lyon. Oh, all right. Helen, give it to me. What happened? An hour ago, the receiving hospital telephones me that they picked you up in some gutter. I come down to see what's what, and you lay there and ask me what's this. Well, it was the wrong job. Another punk client. As long as they've got the dough, we love them all. Who are you fighting with? A couple of boys named Danny and Georgie. Mm. A couple of boys named Danny and Georgie. Mm. Well, would you mind telling me just where you've been while you should have been doing what you were hired to do? I was out with Danny and Georgie. Sure. You were out with Danny and Georgie. But what did you do before that? And what did you do with the necklace? That diamond quartet or whatever it is. I mailed it. You mailed it? You were hired to deliver that thing personally, and you mail it. Where's my clothes? <laughs> Regan, I'll never understand you. I'll never understand you or the way you do things. I send you out on a simple little job. All you have to do is take a necklace back, and what do you do? You wind up bleeding all over the city streets. Here's your pants. What time you got? Three o'clock in the morning. It's always three o'clock in the morning when somebody telephones me that you're in trouble somewhere. Well, why don't you go home and go back to bed? I haven't been to bed. I haven't had one wink of sleep tonight. You know why? Because on top of all my other troubles, some dame who sounds like she has a suit full of hooch has been calling my place every half hour asking for you. My place. Why didn't you tell her to call my place? I did tell her to call your place. I told her a couple of hundred times to call your place. Then I told her to shut up. Coach. Here. Uh, you look terrible. Terrible. She'd give you a name? Oh, Annabella something or other. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, what I want to know is... Uh, hey, where are you going? Who's going to pay this hospital bill? What are you... Where are you going? Well, the cab driver circled twice before he picked me up, but he got me out to her place in 20 minutes. When I got upstairs, her door was halfway open, and the light from the hallway kind of seeped in. She was sitting in a big chair right by the door. I don't know why, but she was holding the phone on her lap, just sitting there, looking at nothing. Oh, Mr. Reader. It's you. You came back. Yeah. I don't think you're going to need this. Well then, Mr. Regan. Well then. I suppose you've met some people tonight who know a great deal about me. Some? A gambler? A jeweler? And of course they told you how I carry on with money and all that. Everyone seems to know that. Yeah, Bailey told me. Do you know about Charles? Charles and I had so many things together. and It was so much fun being alive with him. You like to have fun, Mr. Regan? I, I do think he enjoyed being alive with me. I mean, I, I, I cried when Charles was killed. I really did. I cried. I, I didn't know what to do. I cried. How long ago was that? Oh, Charles was killed three years ago. But now I have Teddy. He's really a dear. You should meet him. We should all have a drink together or something. Teddy's a fine artist. Very fine artist. I, I think you'll be very prominent someday, I, I do. I... I really do think Teddy will be very proud of some... Uh, he, uh, of course, it wouldn't make any difference now. But did they tell you that I... 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 I, I did they tell you... It's funny. I can't seem to get my tongue adjusted to my mouth. Has that ever happened to you, Mr. Regan? Sometimes. Teddy asked me to marry him tonight. He did? Yes, I... I, 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 I... I've been very lonely since Charles died. And it isn't my money that Teddy's interested in, I'm, I'm certain. Teddy has some money of his own, although many people don't know it. <clears throat> what is money, Mr. Regan? What would you say, my, my, my money? Oh, yes, I go into that business about my tongue. <laughs> you think I should see a correction? Why did you call me tonight? You're the only detective I know. And I, I really don't know you. It's just that Mr. Davies said you were a detective. Why did you want to see me? I really can't understand money. I know it must sound strange to you, but... <laughs> some people live for it, and... and some people die for it, and... and some people... <laughs> 
What's wrong? What is it? Come on. Oh, they do look so funny. So very funny. I've seen them count money. Oh, so much money. I really believe that's all they look for. They handle it and caress it now. Come on, tell me what's wrong. What is it? What is it? She was pointing to a black spot across the room. I found the light switch and turned it on. Oh, yeah. They looked funny, all right. It was Daly and his dumb roulette table man, Felix. And both of them were as dead as you can get. Your name's Silco? Oh, 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 yes, I was expecting... My name's Regan. I'm a private investigator. I'm calling from her apartment. Annabella's? Well, now, you... listen. There's been a couple of murders here. What? She's had quite a jolt. She's going to need you and all the help she can get. I called homicide and... Well, it might be kind of rough for her. I'll bring a doctor. And a lawyer. I've got a good one. I'll be there in ten minutes. Thank you. Well, he showed up about the same time when Deddy and the homicide boys got there. By that time... She couldn't even talk, and they had to put her to sleep. I told Wendetti what I knew about it, and he said we'd get it straightened around as soon as it, she had something to say. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning when I got home. I didn't expect my boy to show up so soon. He was already there. Ah, uh, Regan. I've been expecting you. Come in, sir. Come in. I've been amusing myself with your chessboard. So we meet again. Sit down, sit down. You made rather a hectic night, I'll wager. Your boys were pretty rough. Georgie and Danny. Yeah. Two men of another world, Regan. Not our world. Allow me to apologize for their actions. And so unnecessary, too. I underestimated you, Regan. Such an ingenious method of protecting the diamond quartet. Why, sir, by the simple expedient of placing a three-cent stamp on an envelope and mailing it to you yourself, you were hired as guardians the entire United States Postal Service. Not to mention the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. You want one of these? No, thank you, Regan. Much too early in the day. But uh, go ahead. You give me cause to admire you again, sir. I'm one of those faint-hearted persons who cannot abide liquor until five o'clock in the afternoon. All right. What happens now? By God, I admire your directness, Mr. Regan. When I met you last night, I promised myself you'd give me trouble, and you have. Who's in on it? Such directness. In answer, sir, that is a matter to be explained. Double cross. If you can bear my vanity, I have invented a new word. Triple cross. It does have a ring to it, doesn't it? Sounds familiar. <laughs> my God, sir, I like you. Daily in on this? Daily? No, 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 of course not. A mere instigator. But when Madge explained to me that he was returning the diamond to Cortez, I first conceived the plan. Just plain Madge. She and her friends have been very valuable to me. They knocked off Daly and Felix and planted them in the girl's apartment. Right. With two cadavers in her living room, Mrs. Callender was very unlikely to discuss missing jewelry with the police. Then it was a phony she was wearing and she didn't even know it, huh? <clears throat> and it caused all of this. <laughs> if you had merely returned it, it would have been simple to remove it from her. <laughs> but then... And you just sit here and wait for the mail. We wait for the mail, Mr. Regan. What about your playmates? <laughs> you do act your role, don't you? And I like you for it, Mr. Regan. I wish you and I could have worked out something together. An unbeatable team. In answer, sir, I'm afraid I should be sought for murder for two this night. Danny and Georgie? And, uh, Madge. Does that name bother you as much as it bothers me? Give me a woman with a name like Celeste or... Josephine or Roxanne. Those are our proper names for the creatures. But Madge. <laughs> Where are the police going to find all these bodies? In my hotel room, which I departed hastily. I know a man down a central homicide named Wendetti. Do you? Mm-hmm. He's the best cop I've ever seen. You'll never get away with it. Allow me to correct you, sir. I don't intend to get away with it. Observe me well. You see before you a man advanced in years, attached to a destitute and bankrupt jewelry firm 
with nothing more to look forward to than a grim few years and finally the end. Now an opportunity to live like a king and by cancer I've taken it. They'll pick you up before you can pack a bag. <laughs> I'll risk that. I shall turn the diamond quartet into cash and with a well-laden purse, I shall be satisfied to elude the police over half the world. Oh, yes, they'll get me. In two years, three years, perhaps. By that time, I shall have spent the money. And what more could a man ask than a perfect fulfillment of all his wishes? Huh? <laughs> I ask you, sir, as one gentleman to another, what more could a man ask? You have company, and I have a gun. Answer it. Tell him to go away. I'll be right beside you. All right. Open it. One side, Thomas. I got a gun. Madge. Thought I'd find you here, brother boy. You didn't do such a good job on me. Caution, my dear. I have a gun, too. I can last long enough to let you have it. Get out of my way, people. Oh. I believe I, I've been shot. I need a better assistant. I can't seem to hold my feet, sir. I can't seem to hold my feet. The motor is Neil Missy Bonham, Mr. Regan. Or, if your second year Latin escapes you, speak well. I'm the dead. It was an awkward plan at best. Was it? It was a lousy idea. Well, there wasn't anybody left for Wendetti to arrest, so we sat around and looked at each other. Wendetti agreed that Mads double-crossed Daly. Tartaglia double-crossed Mads and her boys. Yeah, triple cross. Well, the lion had something on his mind. He wanted to know, was I satisfied with what I got out of this case? I didn't answer him. I need the job. Army Nurse Corps Reserve still has commissions available. If you are a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. Graduate work is provided at the Army's most modern teaching center, and the nurses obtain educational experiences that benefit them in both civilian and military nursing. If you believe you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan, with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. The role of Bert Tartaglia was played by Barry Kroger. Lorene Tuttle was Annabella Callender. It's CBS same time next week for Trouble, Suspense, and Thrilling Adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Gordon T. Hughes, directed tonight by Cliff Howell. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first with premium quality and best for you. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent.
You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a missing persons detail. You get a call that a man is missing. He failed to return from his work the day before. There are no leads to his whereabouts. Your job, find him. Here is Chesterfield's record with smokers, and important to you. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report of a doctor who has been examining a group of Chesterfield smokers for a full year and two months as a part of a program supervised by a responsible independent research laboratory. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality. Chesterfield. First choice of young America. And that's from a survey made in 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Chesterfield. Regular or king size. They're much milder and best for you. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 16th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of Homicide Division, missing persons detail. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Thad Brown. My name's Friday. I was on my way back to the office, and it was 11.59 p.m. when I got to room 24. Missing persons. What was his mental condition when you last saw him, Mr. Ford? Where'd you last see him? Was he driving his car? Mm-hmm. And what time was that? Yes, ma'am, what was the exact time? I see. And your address? And the phone, please. Now, can you think of anything you forgot to tell me? Right. Right. Oh, you gave me that before. Mm-hmm. Now, was your husband a drinking man, ma'am? Oh, I see. Okay, Miss Borg, we'll make a check. Call you back. Yes, ma'am, we'll do our best, thanks. Anything? Man with the name of Borg missing. Mm-hmm. I'm sure glad my wife doesn't call for help every time I miss a meal. Trouble with most guys is to let a woman keep tabs on them. Check on everything they do. Let me see that 97, will you? Yeah, there you go. It's everything his wife gave me. Mm-hmm. When you get the jails and records, I'll check Georgia Street County Hospital in the morgue. Looked like a routine investigation. Lots of things can keep a man from getting home. A few drinks, a sick friend, unexpected business conference, a flat tire on an isolated road, maybe just boredom. But there are other things that can keep a man from getting home. It had to be checked out. Henry Borg, 51, male, white American... Address, 1571 East Barendo Street, had failed to return home at the usual time on Monday. His wife called one of the men he worked with and found that he hadn't been at work all day that day. He still hadn't come home the next afternoon. She called us. I checked the Gaga file to see if he was one of our regular customers, mental case or alcoholic. He wasn't. Frank and I checked the jails, the hospitals, and the morgue. They had no record of him there. No John Doe's fitting his description. And Borg had no criminal record. We could assume that he was at least alive. Frank called Mrs. Borg back, told her not to worry, and asked her to call us immediately if she heard from her husband. Wednesday, 3.10 p.m., still no word of Henry Borg. At the day watch, it made another check of the jails, the hospitals, and the morgue. Mrs. Borg called three times. The day watch officer's notes described her as very upset. I called her back and asked her to come in the next day to file a missing persons report. I asked her also to bring in the best picture she had of her husband. Thursday, 2.40 p.m., Mrs. Borg was waiting with Frank when I got to work. She'd already filled out the Form 316. She was holding an aging Pekingese dog in her arms. Joe, this is Mrs. Borg. How are you, ma'am? My partner, Joe Friday, ma'am. Uh, hello, Officer Friday. I talked to Mr. Smith and filled out the paper. Here's that picture you wanted. Oh, yes. Thank you very much, ma'am. It's a good likeness. Mm-hmm. Now, Mrs. Borg, I see here that you haven't put anything down under personal habits for your husband. Well, I don't understand. Well, does your husband drink at all, ma'am? Henry? No. He takes a glass of beer with his supper when he comes home, but he's not what a person would call a drinking person. Gamble? Gamble? Yes, ma'am. Cards, dice, horses. Oh, I should say not. He never does nothing like that. You've never known him to gamble at all, then? Henry? 
I should say not. Now, Miss Borg, you say here that your husband has no relatives. Oh, only a brother, Ed, older brother, but I didn't put him down. We don't know where he lives. Haven't heard a word about him nine, ten years. Mm-hmm. What about your family? Your husband friendly with your family? My family hasn't spoke to me since the day I married Henry Borg. Mrs. Borg, I see you only have one friend listed, a Hal Bishop. That's the man your husband rode to work with, isn't it? Yes. Do you know Mr. Bishop's address? No, I don't. Did your husband ride to work with Bishop every day? You say he left his car at home Monday. Did he ever drive it to work? Well, he usually drove our car, but then he'd ride with Mr. Bishop pretty often, too. I didn't think anything about it. It didn't seem like anything. Well, did your husband spend much time with this Bishop? No, just at work. Henry used to like to spend his free time with me. All right, now, ma'am, please don't get upset here. Did your husband have any financial problems, debts that were worrying him? Financial difficulties, like bills and things? No, Henry always took care of it. Do you think there might have been anything you didn't know about that was worrying him? Officer, if Henry was worried about anything, I'd have known it. He'd have told me for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, what about your home? Do you own it? What do you mean? Was there a mortgage on it, I mean? Yes. Do you have the pink slip on your car? No, no. Well, is it possible that your husband was behind in the payments? No, no. He would have told me. Well, did he owe money down where he worked? No, not that I know of. His job, maybe. Was he worried about that? Mr. Snyder, that's his boss. Well, he always said Henry would have a job as long as he was in the contracting business. Henry makes good wages. Mm-hmm. Now, you say here his mental condition was good. Has that ever been poor? You ever know your husband to black out? How do you mean, black out? Well, has he ever suffered from lapse of memory? Is there any history of epilepsy in his family? History of epilepsy? Oh, no, not Henry. Why, he's a healthy man. He hasn't had a sick day. Now, Miss Borg, have you and your husband been getting along lately? What do you mean by a thing like that, officer? You think Henry and I had a fight and that's why he left. Is that what you think? No, ma'am. We don't think anything here, but these are the things we have to check out. Well, it's a waste of time. Don't you think I'd have already told you that? If Henry and I had a fight, I'd have told your first officer the first thing I'd have said. Yes, ma'am. Something's happened to my husband, officer. I just know it. Something's happened to him. Did you and your husband go out together much, ma'am? Well... One night last month, we went to the Coconut Grove, there in the Ambassador Hotel. And we used to go up the movies pretty regular. Was he in the habit of leaving the house at night alone? No. Just when he went out with Francine. Francine? Yes, our, our Pekingese here. Three fifty-five p.m., Thursday, June 18th began to look as if Henry Borg was in trouble. From what we'd been told, he wasn't a man who had just suddenly decided to leave home. We had to find out if the facts we'd been given were accurate. Thursday, 4.10 p.m. We contacted Borg's friend, Hal Bishop, just as he was leaving the construction job where they both worked. He said he hadn't gone by Borg's house to pick him up Monday because Borg hadn't asked him to. The way they worked it, Borg always told him the day before if he wanted a ride. At first, Bishop said he hadn't noticed anything strange about Borg recently. Then he decided Borg had been a little irritable the last few days said it wasn't like him to be irritable, that he'd never known Borg to miss work before, and that he'd never heard of any trouble between Borg and his wife. He said that Borg didn't talk much about his wife. We called on the neighbors of the Borgs. They said nothing to indicate any flaws in Mrs. Borg's story. Henry and Martha Borg were average people in an average neighborhood. He went to work every morning at 7 a.m., came home at 5.15. His neighbors didn't know much about him. He was a quiet man. They lived in the same house for 13 years. Martha Borg was 47, maybe 48. They never had visitors. After 13 years in the same neighborhood, she apparently had no close friends. Two of her neighbors had noticed that in the past year, Martha Borg would leave her house three or four times a week at 11 a.m. Always at 11 a.m. She invariably got back before her husband did. The neighbor said she usually brought some shopping home with her. They did go out frequently in the evenings. However, there were no reports of family trouble between Martha and Henry Borg. Thursday, 6.20 p.m. We talked to Adolph Wernicke, whose grocery store was on the corner a half a block from the Borg home. They'd been trading with him ever since they moved to the neighborhood. I don't know what to tell you about Mr. Borg, officer. He always seemed like a nice fellow to me. He didn't say much, but nice. Sure is funny, him disappearing like that. Mm. You got any idea if he had any trouble with his wife? No, that wife. She's a funny one. Different from Mr. Borg is day and night. Well, how's that, sir? I don't know. High hat, sort of. She's all right, I guess. Kind of show-off, though. Kind of person who dresses up when she goes shopping around the corner. Likes to buy fancy groceries. Stuff I never get calls for. 
Like those anchovies up there on the shelf. Now, I'll bet you I won't sell two cans of them in a year, but Mrs. Borg comes in and she'll buy them. Now, Mr. Borg, you don't like that kind of stuff at all. Told me so himself. Yes, sir, but how'd they get along? You ever say anything about his wife? To tell you the truth, officer, I don't know. As far as a man and his wife arguing, I don't pry. It hurts business. Come to think of it, he did say one thing. That was a long time ago, about two, three months ago, maybe more. But what was that? What did he say? Well, he came in here, just about like this time it was. Didn't buy anything, just kind of hung around. Remember, he seemed out of sorts. I asked him if he was feeling all right. He said he was. Just felt like he had to get away from the house. Now, that'll happen to a man. Just feel like you got to get away for a while. But you know what I mean, officer. No, sir, I'm not married. Thursday, 7.50 p.m. Borg's description and the circumstances of his disappearance have been broadcast to all units. Still no word. 4.10 p.m., Friday, June 19th. We checked Borg's union. He hadn't reported for a new job. We filed an all-points bulletin. 8.05 p.m., I checked back into the office. Mrs. Borg was waiting. Sergeant Friday, I'd like to know just what's going on around here. My husband has been missing almost a week, and I don't see why something hasn't been done about it. If you can't find my husband, then why don't they put more men on this case? This is a terrible thing. I'm a woman alone, and the police haven't done a single thing. My husband may be dead. He may be dead, and nobody's doing anything about it. In my work, you hear it every day, but you can't get mad. It's against regulations, and you can't blame them either. They're in trouble, so you let them talk. You try to explain. They don't listen, but you try. Well, we're doing all we can, ma'am. They're always talking these days about giving policemen more money. It seems to me there are certain policemen who aren't even earning the money they get right now. Yes, ma'am. What are you doing for my husband? Miss Borg, here's the file on it. Now, we've made regular checks on the hospitals, the jails, and the morgues. Thursday night, when you came in to file that Form 316, we had a complete description of your husband broadcast to all radio units in the city. It was teletyped to every police division. Today, we sent out an all-points bulletin over the state wire. Every police department, sheriff's office, and highway patrol unit in the state knows that your husband is missing. Here, you can see the bulletin right here, ma'am. Now, in these cases, ma'am, we start with nothing. We don't know where they've gone or why they've gone. Most of them turn up by themselves. Some of them don't. We do everything we can to find the ones that don't. Miss Borg, there are 4,000 police officers in this city looking for your husband. Eight fifty-seven p.m. When we thought Mrs. Borg was feeling better, we sent her home. We reminded her again to notify us immediately if she heard from her husband. Nine ten p.m. The desk at Central called and told us that they'd picked up a John Doe. From what they said, he apparently was suffering from amnesia. While I went down to Homicide to check out some reports, Frank went over to Central to see the man they picked up. Nine sixteen p.m. Frank came back to the office. Joe. Yeah. I checked out that John Doe at Central. Anything on him? Yes, yeah, Henry Borg. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of all cigarettes. Chesterfield quality is highest. Here's the proof. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. 15% higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality highest. 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality and best for you. Try Chesterfield today. Regular or king size. Nine eighteen p.m. Officers Gorman and Mayer brought in Henry Borg, alias John Doe. They found him wandering around in the 900 block down on South Spring Street, the financial district. Wasn't much reason for anybody to be loitering around there at that time of night. All the businesses in the area were closed. The officers investigated. When they questioned the suspect, he would not or could not reply. They took him to Central Division, where the watch commander, Lieutenant Hale, had him shaken down. His wallet was missing. No papers, no identification. In his pockets, the officers found eight cents, a key ring, and several keys. No cigarettes, no matches. He was dressed in a good quality worsted suit. Very rumpled. No tie, no hat. Gorman and Mayer had rolled his prints at the city hall and sent them to Leighton Prince for classification. During this time, no one let him know that we had any idea who he was. The two officers that had picked him up stood by. Frank and I walked over to where he was sitting. Do you know who you are? 
Feel sick? Been drinking, maybe? Would you have a rough night? Look, if you can talk, mister, I think you better make things a lot simpler here. We're trying to help you. How about telling us who you are? Maybe there's something wrong with you, mister, but we don't think so. We want to know who you are. We want you to tell us. If you don't, the only thing we can do is let them book you at city jail as a John Doe. That's the law. Now, look, if you're trying to hide something, if you're wanted, we're going to know it in a few minutes anyhow. If you want to wait, we'll wait it out with you. You want us to think you're an amnesia case, is that it? Well, maybe you got a good reason, but it won't work. I've been in this department a long time. I've seen a lot of phony amnesia cases. I've only seen one real one, and he didn't act like you. You want to know what I think? I think you're pulling a phony. Come on, how about it, mister? I got it. Missing persons, Friday. All right. Yeah. You bet. Thanks very much. Right. That was Leighton Prince, mister. They got your fingerprints classified. Now, we know you're not wanted for anything. Look, we know you're not a bum. Your clothes are good and you look like a guy who takes good care of himself. A man like you doesn't walk around without a wallet. What happened to you? You got a problem? Tell us about it. Maybe we can help you. Now, why don't you tell us who you are? You probably got a wife. She must be mighty worried about you right now. All right. <coughs> Book him. I lost my wallet. How? I don't know how. Where? I don't know where I've been. Now, you listen to me, mister. We want to know who you are. We want to know where you've been, and we want to know right now. I don't know who I am. Let me see your hands. What? Your hands. Come on, hold them up. Let me see them. That's it. Now, I'm going to tell you something about yourself, mister. You work for a living, don't you? Hard work with your hands. Like a mason, maybe. Huh? Yeah, maybe you're a mason or a hod carrier. You could be a painter. Some kind of construction work, I'd say. Something like a plasterer, for instance, huh? You couldn't be a plasterer by any chance, could you, mister? I don't know. Okay. You ready to talk to us now, Henry? I wasn't trying to fool you. I was only trying to fool myself. Now, we've been looking for you since Tuesday, Borg. Your wife's pretty worried. I'm not going back. No matter what you do, I'm not going back. We're not going to make you go back. That's up to you, Borg. All I pay us for, mister, is to find you, to make sure you're okay. None of our business if you go back. I'm not going back. All right, now, look, you're pretty upset, Borg. Why don't you tell us about it? It's crazy. It's crazy what I did. It doesn't make any sense. You fellas, you wouldn't be interested. Maybe I'll just go if it's all right with you. I'll just go. Yeah, it's all right. It's okay if you want to. Look, we're going to be around here another hour. We haven't got much to do. Our work's all cleaned up. We're just about ready to go home. Why don't you stick around and talk to us, huh? We'd kind of like to hear what happened. Yeah. Just might help to clear things up in your mind if you talked about it. It's crazy. I know it's crazy, but I guess I do want to tell somebody about it. How about a cigarette? Will that help? Yeah. May I give you a match? I am a man 50 years old. I work hard. I learned my trade as a boy of 16. I've been at it ever since. My wife and me, we got a new car. We got our own home. Almost paid for. A man my age, when he gets home nights, he wants to take it easy. Read the paper. Watch the television. Bought a $400 TV, 21-inch screen. Yeah. You want to know what happens when I get home? She wants to go out. It don't make any difference how tired I am. It don't make any difference if I've been working hard all day. She wants to go out. Do you know what that's like? Well, it doesn't sound like the reason a man would leave home, boy. I don't mind it once in a while if it was just once in a while, but she's after me every minute I'm home. Here for the last few years, it's been every night. I don't know what's come over her. She didn't used to be like that. Martha used to be a sensible woman. Now she acts silly like a young girl. She's different. Goes in for fancy clothes, all kinds of fancy food, even anchovies. And I don't like anchovies. Last month, I swear, she even made me take her down to the Ambassador Hotel. Imagine me at the Ambassador Hotel. All I ever hear from her is we've just got a few years left to have our fling. I don't want any fling. I'm a plasterer. That's hard work. 
I get home, I want to rest. It isn't like I cared if she goes out. She goes to the movies almost every day. Goes before noon, she tells me, before the prices go up. I don't care about the money. I want her to have a good time, the clothes, the things like that. I don't care. I love my wife. I guess you think I'm crazy after what I did, but I love my wife. I see, sir. And that dog, that Francine, what kind of a name is that for a dog? You ought to hear her talk to it like it was a person. How long you had the dog, Board? I don't know. Two, three years. Well, the reason I ask seems funny. You just decided to leave home last Monday. Dog's been around two or three years. The ambassador thing was last month, he said. Well, what did it? It was the lessons. Lessons? The dancing lessons. What? But there's this social club up around Pico and Figueroa. People go there to dance. People our age, she says. Only I can't dance. That's when she gets this idea, I gotta take dancing lessons. Did you ever hear of anything like that? A man my age has gotta take dancing lessons? That's when you left. It was Sunday afternoon, when she got this idea. She kept picking at me all afternoon. It really got me. I thought about it all night. I couldn't sleep. Monday morning, I just didn't go to work. I got drunk instead. Got sick, too. Just couldn't think of anything else to do. Guess you know the rest. I lost my tie, my wallet, lost my hat, too. And they picked me up. I was just kind of wandering around when they picked me up. Seems like a shame when a man can't even go home. Mm -hmm. You sure you don't want to go home now, Board? Maybe if you talk things over with your wife. No, no, it wouldn't do any good. Nothing I could say to her would do any good. I can't go home. Well, it sure has been interesting hearing you talk, Mr. Borg. <laughs> it's almost like hearing somebody tell about me, remember, Joe? Yeah. You had something like this? Had it. With me, it was canasta, though. I hate cards, a waste of time. Yeah, I sure thought it was the end for me and Faye. Remember, Joe? But it wasn't? No, for a while, there, it sure looked like I was going to lose my happy home. Guess I would have, too, but I talked turkey to her. You know what I mean, Borg? No. What do you mean? Talk turkey to him. Make him understand. You let a woman push you around, Borg, you're dead. Well, Miss Martha... Is... Look, they're all the same. I sat her right down on the sofa and I said, Now, look, Faye, and I told her what the score was. She took it, too. It's the only way to do. You try what I say, Borg, you'll see I'm right. I can just see, Martha, if I ever tried to put my foot down. That's what I thought. I was all set to give it up. Move in with Joe here, right, Joe? Yeah. Then I figured I might as well at least get a load off my chest. Once I got started, I lost my temper. You know, it's a funny thing. Faye's always thought more of me since then. You ask her. She'll tell you so herself. Says she respects a man who'll stand up for his own rights. Right, Joe? Well, yeah. I don't know. With me, I, I don't think it would work. Sure it can. Now, Borg, you listen to me. You tell her you're a working man. Tell her when you get through work, you want to take it easy and nobody's going to run you. Set her straight, Borg. Get tough if you have to. She won't give you any trouble after that. I... Just don't know. Martha... Did... Won't do any harm to try it. I'd like to see Martha's face just once if I even told her to shut up. I wouldn't want her to have anything handy to throw. Borg, look, it's 12.10. We've got to be getting home now. You take my advice. You go home, too. Have a talk with her. See if you can't work it out. No. No, Sergeant. Thanks a lot, but I can't go home. Well, like I told you, it's none of our business, but I think you ought to try it. Well, here... Well, look, you're going to need car fare. Here's a dollar. You take this and go on home. That'll get you there. Yeah. Okay. You'll get this back, Sergeant. I'll pay it back to you. I I guess maybe you're right. Can't hurt anything to try. Oh, it's stuff. Thank you a lot. I didn't mean to put you fellas out this way. Good luck to you, Borg. You'll see. It'll work. Maybe it'll work. Well... But I don't know. Martha. I'll get out of cancellation, Joe. I should wrap it up, huh? Yeah. What time did you say it was? It's 12.10. Yeah. Well, Joe, I better make a phone call first. This time of night? Why? What's the matter? I just remembered I told Faye I'd call her. Friday, July 28th. A month had passed since Henry Borg had left our office to go home. We'd heard nothing further from him or his wife... We assumed that they had reconciled their problems. 
Six ten p.m. Officers. Oh, hello there, Borg. Nice to see you again. Hi, Borg. I was afraid maybe you fellas wouldn't remember me. It's been a while. I tried to get out and see you before this. Well, fine. How are things going? Did it work out like I said? I brought you something, Sergeant. Some cigarettes for both of you. Like you to have them. I hope it's the right brand. Well, yes, sir. That's the right brand, all right. But you don't owe us anything. I want you to have them. That's all right, sir. You keep them. All right. Well, anyway, here's that dollar, the one you loaned me. Okay, Borg. Thanks very much. I sure owe you fellas a lot, and I really mean it. My wife and I, we sure appreciate what you fellas did for us. It... Was that clock right? Yes, sir. Uh-oh, got a rush. Got an appointment. Be late if I don't hurry. Appointment? Yeah. Got to get over to Arthur Murray's. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 31st, a meeting was held in the office of the captain of homicide. In a moment, the results of that meeting. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, we hope you've been listening to Dragnet regularly, and we hope you've tried our Chesterfields. If you haven't tried them yet, then tomorrow's your day. Get a carton, regular or king size. It only takes one carton at Chesterfields to show you why Chesterfield is best for you. Believe me, they're much milder with a wonderful taste. America's best cigarette buy, Chesterfield. Since the subject, Henry George Borg, had committed no crime, he was not held and the case was officially marked closed. just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Frazier. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Perrin, Irene Tedro. Script by Paul Coates. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's, either regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. By special request, Dragnet is being sent to our servicemen and women all over the world. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork-tipped Fatima? It's the smooth smoke. Here's why. New Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering. And Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, Fatima has the tip for your lips. Try new Fatima. See how smooth it is. Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. my office door behind her started walking slowly toward me. Her lips looked warm. Her eyes looked cool. Matter of fact, everything about her looked awfully good to me, except for one thing. That big black gun she was pointing at my belt buckle. No 
New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Wandering Fingerprints. Yeah, what'll it be, bud? Huh? Oh, nothing, man. I'm just waiting for somebody. Nothing. Look, Mac, you're in a bar. People usually drink in bars. That's what we're in business for. Okay, okay. Give me a give me a bottle of pop. A what? A bottle of pop. That's what I thought you said. Look, Junior, do you mind? No. Uh-uh. Thanks. Mike Shane? Uh, yeah. I'm sick, lad. Bring your drink over to the table here. Okay. Been waiting long? Oh, just a couple of minutes. Well, let's have it. You said on the phone they'd be going. That could be. Uh, look, Ziegler, let's not play guessing games. What's your pitch? You and I are going to be partners, Shane. Partners? What do you mean? I've got a little proposition you are going to go for. You know, you sound awful sure of yourself. Oh, I am. Well, let's have it. All right. Know anything about electrolysis? Ele- Look, I'm no chemical engineer. I am, sort of. Enough of one to have figured out this process. This pr- Look, will you do me a favor? Start at the beginning. All right. I've got a process by which I can transfer fingerprints. You can what? Transfer fingerprints from one place to another. Any place. And that's... Am I? Can't be done. Uh, don't take any bets on that, Shane. You'd have to pay off. Look, I tell you, it's impossible. It's simple, if you know how. So you dust the prints with a certain chemical powder. Uh, you follow me? You take a picture of them, then make an electrolytic plate from the negative. Then dip it in acid. Then you make a mold from liquid rubber. And there you are. Where? With a little rubber stamp of somebody's fingerprint. Look, uh, I don't know anything about this chemical double talk you're giving me, but the whole thing's impossible. You just can't... Like I say, don't take any bets. Now, here's where you figure. We're going to start a little fingerprint service. We, uh, we sign up various clients. They all pay an initiation fee. A large one, as a matter of fact. Uh, just a minute. What do these people get for signing up? Well, it's not so much what they get if they sign up. It's what they get if they don't. Yeah, that's what I thought. The fingerprints turn up in the wrong place. Exactly. Beat it. Now, Shane, that's not a very wise attitude. If you think I'm going to be a fuck man for a blackmail right? That's an ugly word, Shane, but that's more or less your job. To locate promising clients for me. I said beat it. You know, you're not being smart at all. Look, maybe you didn't hear me. I... All right, I'll give you a little time to think it over. But you'll come around. Yeah? Don't you take any bets on that. Oh, you'll come around, all right. Because, you see, you have no choice. And before very long, I think you'll see exactly what I mean. In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the wandering fingerprints. Well, you run into all kinds, I guess. But that day, I'd hit the jackpot when a character named Ziegler told me to meet him in a bar and offered me the charming job of being a front man in a friendly little blackmail setup. I still didn't believe he could transfer fingerprints like he said, but he sure seemed convinced of it. I turned down his deal in a hurry. He implied I was making a large-sized mistake. Then, as I sat at the table watching him leave, I saw him stop at another table near the door. It was a cool-looking brunette sitting there, alone. Ziegler said something to her and jerked his head in my direction. The brunette favored me with a long, cold frown. Then Ziegler left, but the brunette kept dissecting me with her eyes. I got the hunch that she was in the deal some way with Ziegler. Finally, even though the expression on her face was pushing me back, it was just too much there for me to stay away from. So I picked up my glass and went over to her table. Hello? The answer is no. 
did I ask? What else would you call it? Well, maybe we'd better run through this again from the beginning. Why? Well, maybe we'll come out with a different answer. One that makes a little more sense. The answer will still be no, and that makes plenty of sense to me anyway. Good night, Mr. Shane. Yeah. I sat there with my mouth open while she walked out the door. And I was one puzzled guy. What that little conversation was all about was way beyond me. Either I'd missed a few key words here and there, or... Well, the girl was passing up a great career as a mind reader. The bartender came over to the table about then and started picking up the glasses, so I left. It was still early, and I suddenly felt like doing a little of the town. So I called a redhead I know and asked her if she was busy. She wasn't, so we took in the town. The next morning, feeling chipper as a school kid on Saturday, I tripped down to my office, opened the door, picked up the mail on the floor, and started for my desk. Then I stopped. The chair behind my desk was rocking slowly back and forth, and it was occupied. Hello, Shane. Well, well Inspector LaFever. Inspecting again? Sit down. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you uh, decided to move your headquarters here, or is this a social call? Wrong twice. Well, it's early yet. I'll sharpen up. Now, let's see. What could it be this time? Murder? Maybe robbery? Robbery. Arson? Huh? Robbery. <laughs> uh, look, I, I was kidding. I wasn't. Now, no, no, wait a minute, LaFever. What goes? You know an old family named Chartier, Shane? I live in the quarter. Chartier? And... No, why? Sure. I said no. Haven't paid any social calls on him lately? Say, last night? Look, I told you I don't know him. Why would I be paying him a call? Just trying to give you a break, Shane, but you won't even go halfway. What are you talking about, LaFever? I'll tell you. Last night, the Chardier home was broken into. A bunch of jewelry was stolen. What's that got to do with me? I don't know yet. Maybe plenty. We find your fingerprints there. You... My fi... Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, Inspector, there must be some mistake. My fingerprints couldn't have been there. Shane... Fingerprints are sort of a hobby with us. There wasn't a mistake. They're your prints. How come? I, I don't know how come. I. Oh, no, it couldn't be. You're pretty hard to convince. Well, that's not what I meant. I, I meant... Oh, skip it. It'd sound like it was right out of a book. What would? Look, Lefebvre, I, I didn't rob the Chartier home. Give me credit for more brains than that. I had given you credit, Shane. That's what puzzles me. Hey, hey, any idea what time the robbery took place? Between 12 and 1. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm awfully happy to hear that. Mm-hmm. Alibi? Yeah, I had a date with a redhead. Yeah. You happen to remember her name? Of course, she's a friend of mine. Patty Batterkirk. Patty Batterkirk. <laughs> now, Shane. Look, could I make up a name like that? You could, we'll check it. Yeah, I know you will, Inspector. And, uh, keep in touch, huh? Yeah, I know. Don't leave town. Mm -hmm. One more thing. What is it? How about a little shot of oil for your chair? Hmm? Well, as usual, the inspector left me with a lot of questions and no answers. Not even an answer about the squeaky chair. I sat there for quite a while trying to figure out another logical explanation. And I finally gave up. As far as I could see, there was only one answer. Ziegler was able to transfer fingerprints. And he'd taken this very quaint way of proving it to me. I spent a little while in a half-hearted search for a can of oil and gave up. I guess I must have been staring unhappily out the window for maybe 15 minutes when I heard a slight noise behind me. I turned around and looked up. There, standing beside my desk, was my friend Ziegler. Hello, Shane. You again. Me again. You, were. Um, you had to visit a little while ago, didn't you? Inspecting the fever. So? What did he want, Shane? He just heard a new joke and had to run right down here and tell me. Ah, uh -uh. I think he wanted to tell you about that robbery at the Chartier place. And about your fingerprints being there. Hmm? Uh, okay, okay. I don't know how you did it, but... Very simple. I told you. My process. Yeah, yeah, your process. Look, you may not realize it, but I was just lucky enough to have an alibi for last night. If I hadn't... Oh, but I do realize it. I know you had an alibi. And that's just the way I wanted it. You what? Certainly. I didn't want you to get into trouble. This time. Look, I don't get it. But I don't want to get it. This little game you're playing, that's not going to work. I told you once, I'm not going to be front man for your blackmail pitch, and I still mean it. You know, you are hard to convince. 
Well, I guess I have no other alternative. What do you mean? Oh, just that I'd hate to have the same thing happen to you that happened to Al Metcalf. What? You have heard of Al Metcalf, haven't you? Yeah, I've read about him in the papers. He's on trial for murder. That's right. Hey, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell I'm me that... I'm just pointing out that Al could have been a partner of mine. He had the same opportunity you have. But he was difficult about it. He turned me down. Cold. So? But they, they've got a case against him. It's three to two. He'll be found guilty. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. And it's interesting, isn't it, that most of the case against him is his fingerprints at the scene of the crime. You... You mean you deliberate... You, you planted them? I wouldn't want that to happen to you, Shane. So don't keep me waiting any longer. Hey, don't exactly leave me much choice. Right. So you're my boy, Shane. From now on. And don't ever forget it. Inspector Lefebvre's already had you on the carpet for robbery. Think of the fun he's going to have when he gets you for murder. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the wandering fingerprints. Well, it all started when a character named Ziegler offered me a partnership in a fingerprint planting blackmail corporation. I declined without thanks. So Ziegler promptly planted my fingerprints at the scene of a robbery. Thereby bringing Inspector Lefebvre into my office for an antisocial call. Inspector left after a few minutes to check my alibi, and then Ziegler dropped in. He told me he could, if necessary, plant my prints at the scene of a murder, like he said he'd already done with a guy named Al Metcalf, who, as a matter of fact, was facing a murder rap right now. Well, that sort of weakened my opposition. Ziegler pronounced me his boy. He told me to meet him that night in the same bar, and he'd give me my instructions then. After he left, I grabbed the phone and called Inspector Lefebvre. Homicide, Lefebvre. Shane, Inspector. Yeah. There is a Patty Batterker. Oh, wait a minute. And you were with her last night. So you're in the clear on that robbery, I guess. Thanks. I don't get it at all. Say, incidentally, what's Patty so mad at you about? That's not what I called you about, Lefebvre. Look, you're holding a guy named Al Metcalf on a murder rap. You've been reading back issues. Metcalf's been our guest for weeks. Well, it's a bum rap, Inspector. Metcalf's innocent. Real, Shane? I tell you, he's innocent. Shane, I'll make you a little proposition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You'll run your business, we'll do likewise. Look, I'm trying to tell you Metcalf's fingerprints were planted at the scene of the murder. Yeah. Oh, I know it sounds phony, but it's the truth. It's a guy named Ziegler who can transfer fingerprints. He transferred mine to the scene of that robbery, and he framed Metcalf for this murder the same way. Shane, you're missing a real good bet. The pulp magazines are just crying for guys that can come up with stuff like that. Okay, okay, but I'm telling you, Lefebvre, Metcalf's innocent. And what's more, I'm going to prove it to you. All of which was easier said than done, of course. I went over to the library and spent an hour or so reading up on the Metcalf case in the papers. I copied down the names of most of the people involved, and then I started out. The first guy I tried was a pawnbroker. Sure, sure, no doubt about it. Metcalf's the guy who bought the gun from me. The gun that killed Joey Krauss. I checked out the pawnbroker's name and went to see the woman who had been the dead man's landlady. I saw this Al Metcalf go into Mr. Krauss's room that night, just about five minutes before the shot was fired, and Metcalf was the only visitor Mr. Krauss had that night. The next guy I tried was a character named Dixon, who used to be a pal at Krauss's. Motive? Sure, Metcalf had a motive. A girl named Bunny. She was Metcalf's girl. Then she got to running around with Krauss. So, Metcalf knocked off Krauss. But take my word for it. Don't go bothering, Bunny, because she's my girl now. Yeah. All the answers are the same. Al Metcalf was guilty. He really had killed Joey Krauss. Well, about then, I got on the trail of a very interesting thought. Wild, but interesting. But also about then, my watch said 8 o'clock, and I was due at the bar to meet Ziegler. Well, I didn't have any more time for meditation. But I knew that somehow, some way, I had to find a weak spot in Ziegler. Something that'd give me a club, too. And then I thought of a gag that might just possibly give me that club. It was old, but it could work. 
Ziegler was sitting at his table waiting for me. As I walked over to him, I could see he didn't look very happy. Sit down, Shane. Yeah, thanks. You're late. A little. I don't like people to be late. What kept you? Look, in case you don't know it, I work for a living. What kept you, Shane? I was conducting a little investigation. Who for? Me. Okay. Shane, you have quite a few things to learn about working for me. Your attitude, for one thing. You'll have to change. But we'll let that go for now. I've got a list of people I'm going to give to you. I want you to contact each of them and sign them up. You can start... Cigarette. Through... Thanks. There's a light. Help yourself. Thank you. Now... Uh, just one thing. What is it? The girl. What girl? The brunette who was sitting over here at the door the last time I talked to you here. Oh, you mean Susan. Do I? What about her? That's what I'm wondering. Where she fits in. Well, let's just say that you and she and I will be sort of uh, in business together. I see. Why? Oh, just after you left, I I went over to her table. Well? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I thought we might make a little light conversation, but she wasn't having any. She can be difficult. She and all this talk about nothing in particular... I somehow get the impression you're trying to stall me. That it would be very foolish, Shane. Yeah. Yeah, Ziegler, I, I've been trying to stall. But it, it hasn't worked, so I'm not going to stall anymore. Okay, give me that list. I'll go to work. He grinned, gave me the list, and left. Yeah, I was right. I wasn't going to stall anymore. Because that stray thought I'd started working on before had come back. And what brought it back was my remembering I'd taken my drink over to Susan's table that time before. Yeah, I was pretty sure I had the answer now. But pretty sure wasn't sure enough. I scooped up my cigarette lighter and went down to police headquarters. I dropped the lighter off in one of the offices so that the boys could admire it. And then I went to see Inspector Lefebvre. Oh, that boy just loved to swing back and forth in desk chairs. He was at it again. Come down to tell me why Patty, what's her name, is mad at you, Shane? I came down to tell you I was wrong, Inspector. About Patty? No, about Al Metcalf. He's guilty, all right. Well, now, that's real good to know. Now, uh, look. Metcalf's fingerprints were at the scene of the murder, huh? Where were they? Plastered all over the place. Yeah. Now, my fingerprints were at the scene of that robbery at the Chartier House. Mm -hmm. Where were they? Why? Believe me, Lefebvre, I'm asking you the $64 question. Where were my prints? On a glass. Yeah. Thanks, Lefevre. No charge. Oh, are you leaving? Uh-huh. I gotta see a girl named Susan. Need any help? No, this is sort of a private deal. Sure you don't need any help? Sure. Uh, there is one thing, though. What's that? A chair of yours could stand a shot of oil, too. I walked out before he could think of an answer, but I had to hurry. I picked up my lighter and a few interesting facts with it and went back to my office. I signed in to figure out how I was going to find Susan. But I needn't have bothered. Because just about then, my office door opened. In came Susan. She closed the door behind her and started walking slowly toward me. Her lips looked warm and her eyes looked cool. Matter of fact, everything about her looked awfully good to me, except for one thing, that big black gun she was pointing at my belt buckle. Well... You just won't take no for an answer, will you, Shane? Let's not start that double talk again. I tried to tell you before it was no deal. Look, do you have to keep pointing that gun at me and... What's no deal? The setup with Ziegler. Set... Oh, I think I get it now. You don't like the idea of anyone else working with you and Ziegler, is that it? Well, look, Susan, I don't like You've the idea... You've got a great sense of humor, haven't humor? you? Humor? I don't think it's very funny. Neither do I. Look... Maybe, maybe I'm stupid, but none of this makes sense. Stay where you are. None of that little palaver we had the other night in the bar made sense I either. I said stay where so you are. So you're working with Ziegler. I still don't see why. Oh, I'm working with Ziegler. That's a laugh. You're the one who hates. Hey, get back. Too late, sweetheart. You... Let go of me. <laughs> but it was too big a gun for a lady to be carrying around anyway. Or aren't you, lady? <laughs> hey, no. No, not that. Now, no, look. Stop it. Stop it, will you? <laughs> All right. That's better. Uh, let's get this thing straightened out. You're not working with Ziegler? Of course not. He he threatened to 
plant my fingerprints and implicate me in a murder. Well, I'll be... I... You too. Oh, sucker. Me to sucker. You see, I... I could have been implicated, too. It, it was all innocent enough, but I could have been made to look bad. Yeah, we're both in the same boat. And in fact, it's sort of nice in here. You can let go of me now. But I still don't see how Ziegler could have gotten that glass with my prints. I thought you took it. Hey, wait a minute. You can let go. That bartender. The one who was so anxious for me to buy a drink. He came over to our table and picked up the glasses right after you left. He gave it to Ziegler. He's our boy. Oh, Shane. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I seem to have a hold of you. Maybe... Maybe we got to wind up this sinking business, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, with an incentive like that, how could I lose? I charged over to the bar, but the bartender I was looking for was off duty. I got his address, though, and went over. Yeah, what's so... up? Oh, it's you. Yeah, it's me. You want to beat it, Dad? I'm coming in and cut it out. What's right, up, kid? Sigler. Close the door, Jim. Okay. And Shane, back up against that wall over there. Well, looks like I hit the jackpot, Ziegler. Yes. And it's such a pity, too. Because this machine isn't going to pay off with anything except a slug. <laughs> In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, there I was. I'd figured out the whole deal, but at the moment, it looked like there wasn't much future in being a genius. One look at the bartender and Ziegler showed me they didn't think so either. So you figured out my little scheme, eh, Shane? Yeah, lucky me. You know, I thought the mention of the Metcalf case was going to keep you in line. Oh, you pulled that one out of the headlines and tried to make me think you had something to do with it. It seemed to work for a while, anyway. Yeah, until I found out Metcalf really was guilty. No wasting time, Ziegler. The rest wasn't too tough. I have to admit it was a pretty slick little scheme. Hmm, I thought so. Planting that glass with my prints, then making me think you'd transferred the prints from one place to another. Ziggler. Oh, uh, incidentally, you were so interested in the general subject of fingerprints, you got me interested in them, too. Yours. Mine? Uh-huh. I got them off my cigarette lighter. Remember, you used it. Clever, clever. And the boys down at headquarters did a little checking for me. I found out a couple of cities are interested in you. To pick up a one, a bunco charge there, I think. You're always a man for a fast deal, huh? You're very thorough, Shane. I admire it. But. All right, Jim. Yeah. The bartender picked up an empty bottle. Then he held it by the neck, swung it out of the side of the table, and broke it. That left him with a jagged stub in his hand. He started toward me with it. I. I don't like broken glass, but there wasn't much I could do. I raised my arm in front of my face. Take care of him, Knight. Well, Shane? <laughs> well, it's back to the fever. How'd you know? When the boys reported to me that you'd brought in some fingerprints belonging to this guy, Ziegler, I thought maybe we'd better find out what was cooking. So we tells you. Right into the oven. <laughs> Inspector... Would you believe it if I told you I was awfully glad to see you? Yeah. Shane. Yeah? It's a good thing you didn't need any help. Huh? No comment. Well, that was just about that. The fever told me I was in line for some 500 bucks from Topeka. The reward posted to Ziegler. So I was really on top, and I went busting back to my office to tell Susan to pick up where we left off. Susan. <laughs> when I got there, she was gone. I waited, but she didn't come back. I'm still waiting. You know, somewhere along the line, that girl must have read the old fable about getting somebody else to pull hot chestnuts out of the fire for you. Not that I minded that so much, but at least she, she might have flipped a few shells my way. Oh, well. 
There's always Penny Batter cooking, I guess. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Premium quality and best for you. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A young girl has been shot with a 22 caliber rifle. It was reported a suicide. Your job, investigate. Here is Chesterfield's record with smokers, and important to you. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report of a doctor who has been examining a group of Chesterfield smokers for a full year and two months as a part of a program supervised by a responsible independent research laboratory. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality. Chesterfield. First choice of young America. And that's from a survey made in 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Chesterfield. Regular or king size. They're much milder and best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, June 8th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch on a homicide detail. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 8.03 a.m. when I checked into room 42. Homicide. Joe? Yeah? Back here in the skipper's office. Ray Giese wants to talk to you. Right. Morning, Joe. Hi, Ray. What do you got? Suicide. Anything on it? Oh, uh, here's the report. Team from the business office went out last night. Get on it right away, will you? Right, Ray. Right. Let's go, huh? Yeah. Want to check this stuff before we get started? Might as well give us an idea what we got to do. What's the report say there you got? Let's see. According to this, business office got a call at 2.30 this morning. Landlady out in the West Lake Park District called in and said that this young girl had committed suicide. They get an ID on her? No, they got her listed as Jane Doe, number 17. There's a description here. Better check it with missing persons, huh? Uh-huh. How'd the landlady happen to find the body? Well, according to the report, she heard the water running in the apartment, finally went up to see what it was. She knocked on the door, nobody answered. She opened it and went in, found the body. Well, the girl didn't live in the apartment, then. No, the place is rented to a Ross Mitchell. Anything on him? No, says he wasn't home. He was checked through R&I, no make on him. How about prints on the victim? No go. Check them out. Nothing on her here. We could send them on to Washington. Yeah. And they found a suicide note. It's a copy of it here. What's it say? Ross, I've tried to make you understand. Nothing seems to do any good. I've told you that I won't stand in the way of your career, but you don't want to try to make a go of it. I know this doesn't solve anything. It's the only way I can think of. Any signature? No. The report says that the original copy is over at the crime lab for processing. Yeah. Well, I guess we better start with the landlady, huh? It's the best lead we got. Glendo and Bates are out there now. Place was staked right away. Friday, you want to check too? Right, thanks, Ray. It's Friday talking. Yeah. 
Uh-huh. No, we just got it. Is that right? Okay, Max. No, have him wait there, will you? No, we'll be right over. All right, thank you. Well, it's a little break. Max over at the coroner's office says they know who the girl is. Yeah. Her father just identified the body. Eight fourteen a.m. We left the city hall and we went over to the hall of justice. We met the victim's father, a Mr. Robert Andrews Paul. He told us that there could be no mistake. The body was that of his daughter, Gloria Z. Paul. The attendant had given him some smelling salts, and after introducing us, he'd left to close off the viewing room. I don't understand why she'd do it. None of it makes sense. Well, when did you see your daughter last, Mr. Paul? Saturday afternoon. That was the last time. I never saw her again. She was gone Saturday night and all day yesterday, is that it? Yeah. You hear from her at all? No. Weren't you worried about her at all? No, sometimes she doesn't come home, stays with a girlfriend, but when I didn't hear from her last night, I got worried, started calling around. Did she say where she was going when she left? Told me she was going over to see Peggy. Said the two of them were going to a show and that she'd be home for dinner, sure. Well, who is this Peggy? Peggy Rockwell, a friend of Gloria's. Uh-huh. Have you talked to her? What? I say, have you talked to this Peggy since your daughter disappeared? Yes, I called her last night. I talked to her then. I was most out of my mind. I didn't know what to do. I talked to her last night. She didn't know. Did your daughter know anybody named Ross Mitchell? Ross Mitchell? No, I don't think I've ever heard the name. Why do you ask that? I just wondered. You know something about this you're not telling me, is that it? No, sir, we don't. Well, it must be something like that. You don't just come up with a name like that out of thin air. you got to have a reason. Now, look, I'm her father. i got a right to know. All night sitting there waiting for the phone to ring, calling her friends, thinking she's been in an accident, imagining all kinds of things. If you know something, you should tell me. I've got to know. How am I going to tell her mother? Poor woman's almost dead with worry. She doesn't know about this. All she knows is that the baby's gone, that's all. The baby's gone. Glory is dead. I don't know what to do. All right, Mr. Paul, try to take it easy. I'm sorry if you got a cigarette. Yes, sir. Here. Here, I'll give you a light. Sorry about that. It's all right, sir. We understand. Now, do you think you can give us an address where we can talk to this Peggy Rockwell? Yes, yeah, she works at a restaurant over on 7th. I've got a home address, too, if you want it. Yes, sir. We hope you'll understand this, Mr. Paul. We don't mean any offense here. What's that? Did your daughter have any steady boyfriends that you know about? No, I don't think so. No one that she went with steady. No one man she liked more than the others? I think there was. I, I don't know who... Her mother asked her about it a couple of times, wanted to know who the fellow was, but Gloria would never say. Just said that it wasn't serious, it didn't matter. I'd seem to get along with this man, would you know? All right, I guess. I told you, I never saw him. I didn't know who he was. But whenever Gloria had a date with him, she acted like it was something special. Did your daughter have a job? Not regular. She used to model once in a while, and then maybe she'd pick up a day's work in pictures. Not much. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any reason why she'd want to take her own life? No. She seemed pretty happy, never gave any indication there was anything wrong. Has she been ill lately under a doctor's care? No, not that I know about. Well, Mr. Paul, is it possible she might have been seeing a doctor and you wouldn't know about it? No, her mother would have known. She'd have told me. Now, I'm pretty sure she was feeling all right. Anything about her job that bothered her? What do you mean? Well, was she happy with what she was doing, the kind of work she was doing? Oh, yeah. Gloria didn't want a career. She was looking for a husband, one to settle down and raise a family. Mm -hmm. Well, can you think of anything at all that... Might make her want to take her own life, as I asked you before. I can't understand it. None of it makes any sense to me. Where she was found, she didn't know anybody in that part of town. I don't know what she'd be doing over there. Did she drink? I don't think I understand. What well, did she drink much, sir? Bars, cocktail lounges? No, she didn't. Now, Gloria was a good girl. She didn't drink or smoke. She was a good girl, and I don't understand all this. First this thing with Ross, and now you want to know if she drinks. I don't know what you're trying to get at, but I don't like it. You're trying to make Gloria something that she isn't. She's a good girl, always has been. Just a home and family, that's all she wanted, nothing more. I don't know why you're asking me all these questions. I'm her father, you're the police, it's up to you to find the reason. That's your job. Not to come around and say things about my girl. I'm sorry, we're not saying anything, Mr. Paul. You are too, you're trying to make me believe that Gloria wasn't a nice girl. Now, I know different. I raised her since she was a baby, gave her all the care I could. I don't know why she'd do a thing like that. You don't? No. Why ask me these questions? Well, sir, you said it yourself. Huh? You're her father. We continued to talk to the father of the victim. From him, we got a list of the girl's friends, the address, and the names of the people that she worked for. 
While we were talking to him, he was unable to give us any idea as to why his daughter, Gloria Paul, might want to take her own life. He insisted that he didn't know anybody or any one of his daughter's acquaintances named Ross Mitchell. A telephone call was put through to his wife, but she was unable to tell us who the man was. 8.20 a.m., Mr. Paul recovered from the initial shock and he went home. 8.39 a.m., we drove over to the rooming house where Gloria Paul had been found. On the way, we stopped to call the crime lab to see if they'd been able to come up with anything in the dead girl's effects to help us. Lieutenant Lee Jones at the lab told us that they hadn't finished their investigation yet. 8.50 a.m., we arrived at the house and talked with the landlady, Thelma Keene. It's terrible. Poor little thing. You haven't seen Ross Mitchell yet? No, he hasn't come in. I told the officers last night that I didn't expect him until noon today. Have you seen the girl before? Once in a while. She'd come in with Ross, wait for him, and then they'd go right out. Did you see her last night, sir? I told the officers that were here last night that I didn't. Uh, Didn't you talk to them at all? Well, yes, ma'am. We have a report they filed, Mrs. Keene, but we'd like to get some additional facts from you. It seems like a waste of time, but I suppose you have to. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any idea when she might have come in? No, not the slightest. When was the last time you saw Mitchell? Saturday around noon. He came in and told me that he'd be out of town over the weekend. Uh, said for me to keep an eye on the place. Yes, ma'am. Did he tell you where he was going? He said he was going to visit an assistant director friend of his over in La Did you say what the friend's name was? No, they're working on a picture together. Ross just met him the other day, asked him out for the weekend. Ross was very good at making friends. Mm-hmm. Do you know where he's working? No. Ross just said it was a sea adventure, doing it in full color. 3D, too. I guess it's going to be quite a spectacle. They didn't have all the gimmicks in my day. Ma'am? Didn't have 3D or the other things. In my day, we acted. We knew how to act from the heart. These youngsters are good flack to make a star out of anybody. Oh, things have changed. And here, this one. That's me with the pith helmet. This was made over on Catalina Island. Over shooting a jungle picture. We acted. No doubles for us. Real actors. Mm. When was this, ma'am? A few years ago. Now, why are you asking all these questions about Ross? Well, the note the girl left was addressed to him. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. Just some lovesick girl. Doesn't mean Ross had anything to do with it. How'd you happen to find the body? I went to bed about 10.30. They were running one of my old movies on TV, and I stayed up to see it. You happened to catch it? The thing called The Floods Will Come. I made it over at Catalina. It starred Nick Benton, real movie idol. Here's one of the stills from the picture. Yes, ma'am. Here's the whole company. That's me. And that, that's Nick for the putty. He'd put on a little weight. I remember he had to do road work while we were there to trim down. Held the company up for a week. The grand picture. They didn't do it right on television, though. Look, look, Orny. I guess the way they ran it through the machines. You know, we all looked uh, pasty. Even Nick. Yes, ma'am. Would you go on, please? Uh, well, after I saw the rest of the picture, I went up to the kitchen, got a bowl of shredded wheat to eat in bed, came back to the bedroom, and I heard this noise. What noise was that, then? Like somebody was running water in one of the taps. Went on and on. Pretty soon it started to bother me. I couldn't understand it. Uh-huh. Finally, I went up to see who it was. Noise came from Ross's apartment. Mm-hmm. I knocked, but there wasn't any answer, so I unlocked the door and went in. I thought something was wrong. And that's when I saw her. I see. She was lying on bed. Right away, I called the police. Now, before you went up, did you hear any other noises? Any sound of a struggle, anything like that, maybe? No, just the water running. Well, how about the shot, ma'am? You hear that? No, no, I didn't. A lot of shooting in the picture I was watching. Did you touch anything in the room? No, I turned the lights, but that's all. The room was dark when I went in. Just turned on the lights, and then I called you. According to our report, there wasn't any purse found with the body. Did you see one when you went in there? I didn't. But if I had, you'd gotten it. What are you trying to say? That I stole her purse? Is that what you're trying no, to ma'am, say? No, ma'am, that's not what we're trying to Better say. Better not. I've got a reputation in this town. I know a lot of big people. I'm not going to have you come in here and call me a thief. Well, we didn't mean to offend you, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Who has a key to Mitchell's place besides him, ma'am? No one. He's got the only one. I don't like a lot of keys to the rooms out. I tell all the tenants that. Have you got any idea how the girl might have gotten into the room? No. Do you know who the gun belonged to? Yes, it was Ross's. You pretty sure about that, are you? Yes, I saw it when he moved in. Commented on it then. He said that he'd had it since he was a kid. Kept it out of sentiment. Mm-hmm. Oh, what's this all about, anyway? You seem to think that there's something wrong. Is that it? No, ma'am. It's just that in things like this, we have to make a complete investigation. You can understand. Oh, well, I want to do all I can to help you, but I do have an appointment. If there's nothing more you want, I'd like to be going. That's all right, Miss Keene. 
If we want to talk to you, we'll be able to reach you here? Yes, right here. We'll give you a call to tell you about the inquest. Am I going to have to be there? Yes, ma'am. You and Mitchell. Why him? Well, it was his apartment, ma'am. But he didn't have anything to do with well, it. Well, maybe so, ma'am, but he'll still have to be there. It's not fair. A thing like this can ruin him. By the time the papers get through with it, he'll be finished. It can ruin his career. He doesn't know anything about it. He won't be able to tell you anything. Well, you're wrong there, ma'am. Huh? He's got a lot to explain. We went upstairs and met the officer staked out in the room and looked at the apartment where the girl had been found. 9.20 a.m. We gave our card to Thelma Keene and asked her to call us if she thought of anything else. We also asked her to notify us immediately in the event she heard from Mitchell. The stakeout on the room continued. 9.52 a.m. We drove over to the coffee shop on West 7th Street to talk to the girl's friend, Peggy Rockwell. We found her in the back of the place typing out the day's menus. What about Gloria? Something wrong? When was the last time you saw her, miss? Well, let's see. Saturday night, she stayed at my house. Left about noon on Sunday. I had the day off. Figured that maybe we'd do something, but Gloria said she had something to do. Last I saw her was on Sunday morning. You know a man named Ross Mitchell? That bum. Why do you say that, Miss Rockwell? Because he is. Real no good. You pretty friendly with Miss Paul? Well, Gloria thought so. Turned out he was just using her. Well, how do you mean? Thought at first she could get him some jobs. Turned out when he could do better, he dropped her. They were going to get married, and then he thought he could do better, so he dropped her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Say, do you mind if I go ahead with these menus? The boss will be sore if I don't get through with them. No, you go right ahead, miss. We can talk while I'm doing it. Yes, ma'am. I took a course once, touch typing. Didn't think I'd ever use it. Boy, was I fooled. You go right ahead, miss. Well, this Ross really gave her the rush. Had her take him around, introduce him to her friends. She got him a couple of jobs. She's the one who introduced him to Mike. Mike? Yeah, Mike Cowell. That's Ross's agent. Peggy set it up. She's done just about everything for him. Then the bum acts like this. What do you mean, miss? Treated her so bad. Say, how do you spell croquette? Well, I, I think it's C-R-O-Q-U-E-T-T-E-S. O-Q-E-T-T-E-S. Turkey. They had roast turkey last night. I don't understand how people can eat them, but we sure sell a lot of them. Did Miss Paul say she was going to see Ross over the weekend? Yeah. She said she had an appointment with him Sunday. Said she'd called him and set it up. You know what time? No, just said she wasn't going on like this. Had to be straightened out. Mm -hmm. I don't blame her. She's told her friends they were going to get married, and at the last minute, Ross would back out. Her family know about Ross? No. Father didn't mind her doing a little work in show business, but he didn't want her to marry anyone in it. She thought that if they just got married, then the family would understand. Joe? Yeah. I'll call the crime lab, see if they finish. Yeah, fine. Thanks. How did Miss Paul and Mitchell seem to get along, ma'am? What do you mean? Well, did they have any arguments or disagreements, would mm, you know? Not often. Most of the trouble they had was about getting married. Ross kept saying that it wouldn't do him any good to be married now. He thought that it might hurt his career. That's all he thought about. Were you ever present in any of these arguments? Once. We'd gone out on a double date, went to a place down at the beach... Had dinner and then stopped on the way back for a couple of drinks. Uh-huh. Ross got pretty drunk, got into a big thing about his career. Yeah. He went on and on about how hard he'd work, how much the theater meant to him, all that kind of stuff. I see. Finally, he said right out that he'd kill anyone who tried to stop him, just like that. He'd kill anyone who tried to stop him. Yeah, yeah. See you, man. Would you excuse me, please? Sure. Uh, just a minute. Yeah. Um, is there one L or two L's in broccoli? Just one, man. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Just talk to Lee Jones. Yeah, did he finish up? Yeah, something's wrong. What's that? He thinks the girl was murdered. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of all cigarettes. Chesterfield quality is highest. Here's the proof. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. Fifteen percent higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality highest. Thirty-one percent higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield, first with premium quality and best for you. 
Try Chesterfield today, regular or king size. Ten thirty-seven a.m. We drove to the crime lab and talked with Sergeant J. Allen. He told us that when they checked for powder burns on the body, they hadn't found any. They measured the reach of the dead girl and found that it would have been almost impossible for her to have pulled the trigger on the rifle, leaving the fingerprints they found on the gun. Water test failed to show any traces of nitrate powder on her hands. They checked the handwriting on the suicide note found in the room against samples of Gloria Paul's writing and found that they didn't match. From their findings, they said that it was their opinion that the girl had not killed herself, that she'd been murdered. We went back to the city hall and got out a local and an APB on Ross Mitchell. We called the landlady of his rooming house. She hadn't heard from him. 12.30 p.m., we went back to the rooming house and relieved the stakeout. We asked the landlady not to say anything to Mitchell about our being there. 12.45 p.m., still no sign of the suspect. 1 o'clock, 1.30. Who are you? What are you doing in my place? Come on in. Who are you? Police officers. Come on in. Close that door. Put that suitcase down. What's this all about, anyway? What have you guys been doing here? The place is You, all Ross Mitchell? Up? Yeah, why? You know a girl named Gloria Paul? What's she got to do with it? You know her? Yeah, I know her. When's the last time you saw her? Say, what's this all about? What's all these questions? When was the last time you saw Gloria Paul? Friday night, I guess. Don't you know for sure? All right, Friday night. You haven't seen her since? I told you, the last time was Friday you night. You didn't see her Sunday? No. Where were you Saturday and Sunday? Out of town. Where? La Cunada. Can you prove you were there? Why? Can you prove you were there? I don't like all this. You guys coming in here asking a lot of questions, what are you trying to prove? Who are you staying with? A friend of mine. What's his name? I'm not going to have him dragged into this. You haven't got any choice. Well, that's what you say. You haven't told me what this is all about. I'm not telling you anything. Will you tell now me? you look, Mitchell, understand this. We're not here to pass the time of day. You better come up with some answers quick. Now, who are you with? friend of mine, a guy named Sid Austin. What's his phone number? You going to call him? We've got to check your alibi. Now, what's his number? Won't do any good to call him. Thought you said you were there. I was. Then we got to call him. Well, he won't be able to tell you anything. He wasn't there. He just let me use his place. There wasn't anybody there. Who's got a key to this place besides you? You mean here? That's right. Nobody. You got the only key, huh? That's right. The landlady's got one, just the two of them. You got any idea how somebody else could get in here? No. Why? How well do you know Gloria Paul? What's she got to do with it? How well do you know her? We used to go together. Anything serious between you? She thought we might get married. How'd you feel about it? I don't think that's any of your business. Maybe it is. How'd you feel about it? I liked her. She was a nice kid. Nothing more. No. Now you look. I think it's about time you told me what this is all about. Something to do with glory, is that it? That's right. What? She's dead. Hmm. Oh. Can I please have a cigarette? Yeah. Here. Here's a man. Thanks. How'd it happen? Thought maybe you could tell us. Why'd you figure that? Where'd you see her last? Up here. This room? Yeah. When was that? I told you, Friday night. Do you have any trouble with her? No. No argument? I told you no. Well, how'd it happen? Can't you tell me? You own a twenty two rifle? Yeah. You got bullets for it? Yeah, why? Where do you keep it? Closet over there. You keep it loaded? No, the bullets are on the shelf in the closet. All right, come on, Ross. We better go downtown. What for? I want to talk to you. What for? You gotta tell me before I have to go. You gotta tell me what you're holding me for. Suspicion of murder. Now come on. Taking him. Downtown. Why? We want to talk to him. You didn't have anything to do with it, did you, Ross? I don't even know what this is all about. All I know is that Gloria's dead. She killed herself in your room. What? In your room, Ross. It was suicide. Well, they're arresting me for murder. Oh, you can't do that. Ross didn't have anything to do with it. It was suicide. That's what you said. All right, come on, Mitchell. Well, you can't do that. It was suicide. You want to take him out the car, Frank? Yeah. You can see that you're making a mistake. He didn't have anything to do with it. He's going to have enough trouble with that girl killing herself in his apartment. You can't arrest him for murder. It was suicide. What are you trying to tell us, lady? What? Something you want to say here? No, you're making things up. All right, let's go. Yes. Let's go ahead and take him. Go ahead. If he wants to be a star, let him. Go ahead and take him and serve him right. The way he treats people. I tried to help him. God knows I tried. Got him to meet a lot of important people, a lot of contacts. You think he was interested? You bet he was. How's he show it? I'll tell you how. He thanks me for all I've done for him by running around. Chasing after that young nobody, that Gloria. I tried to reason with her, tried to talk some sense into her. Told her that she couldn't do anything for him. 
told her that I could make him a star, bigger than anybody. She said she loved him. She doesn't know how to love. You want to go ahead? I came over here all the time, begging Ross to marry. I told her to get out of his life and stay out to leave him alone. He didn't need her. When was all this? Sunday evening she came here all dressed up. Oh, when they're young, they know everything. I'm one of the biggest stars this town ever had. She's a nobody. I know what's good for that boy. Didn't you tell us you didn't see the girl Sunday, isn't that right? That's what I said. Did you see her Sunday? Yes, I did. She wanted me to let her into Ross's apartment. I told her he wasn't there. She said it didn't make any difference. She'd wait for him. Well? I told her to leave him alone. She didn't understand him. Didn't know how to take care of him. I know the right people. He could have written his own ticket in this town. He could have been big. You don't want him. I killed him. All right. Do you want to get a coat, ma'am? Yes. Doesn't make any difference. I did it to help him. I thought you'd think it was suicide. I didn't think you'd figure anything else. You wrote the note, did you? I did. That's what you've got to understand. For him, that was all that counted. He'd married her and he'd been through. I had to stop it. I didn't want to kill her. But you can see I couldn't let him marry her. Ross is a fine actor. Real talent. He doesn't come along often. All right, lady. Let's go. He'll understand, won't he? He'll know why I did it. He'll understand. I wouldn't know, ma'am. Well? We'll let you ask him. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 14th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, Dragnet Radio is taking a summer vacation. We'll be back in the fall. George Fenneman will tell you all about that in a minute. Meanwhile, I hope you'll watch our TV show regularly, and I also hope that all of you who are not Chesterfield smokers will try them. I like to feel that when we resume broadcasting in the fall, every one of you will have switched to Chesterfield. You'll find they're best for you. And, of course, when you go on that vacation this summer, be sure to take along a couple of cartons, will you? Chesterfield. And we all hope you have a very pleasant summer. <laughs> Thelma Alice Keene was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. She was sentenced to life imprisonment in the California Institute for Women, Corona, California. You have just heard Dragnet a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Vic Perrin. Script by John Robinson, Ben Alexander. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's, either regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. By special request, Dragnet is being sent to our servicemen and women all over the world. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Dragnet leaves radio for the rest of the summer. We'll be back early in September. Watch then for our return. Check the radio listings of your newspaper for the day and time. Please note, however, that if Dragnet is seen on television in your community, it will continue throughout the summer. Have you tried new cork-tipped Fatima? It's the smooth smoke. Here's why. New Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering. And Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, Fatima has the tip for your lips. Try new Fatima. 
See how smooth it is. Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. says, Pat Novak for hire. You don't get in the blue book that way, but you don't embarrass your friends either. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, they don't separate the good and the bad. They let them run together. And before long, you got a caste system. You're either alive or dead. If you're on top, you keep fading the crowd and trying for sevens until you lose the dice. It's not the only way to play it, unless you like worms. I rent boats and do anything else that'll put a fast handle on a buck. But it doesn't always work out because down here all your luck is junior grade and trouble is trumps. I found that out Tuesday night. It was the first time I ever saw Reuben Calloway and the last time, too, if you like to keep a tidy record. It was about 7 o'clock and I'd just started back across the bay from Sausalito. You could still see Mount Tamalpais squatting on the Marin shore. Light brown near the top, but dark and black farther down, like a cupcake that's been in the oven a little too long. A low fog was beginning to squeeze in on the far side, so I kicked in the searchlight, and that's when I picked him up. He was struggling feebly with his face near the water, and he was almost bald, so that when the light hit him, he looked like a cantaloupe that somebody got tired of. I pulled alongside and started to haul him aboard. He brought most of the bay with him. Help me. Please help me. Yeah, well, we'd like to get a hold of you, will you? Come on. There. Sit down. No, here. Lean against the gunnel. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Is the water red or you've been shot a little? Do you have to know everything? No, it's your load. Carry it, mister. Yeah. Move your feet. i got to get us ashore. If you like it, go ahead. But don't hurry for me. Well, if you feel that way about it, pick another spot to die and Go back in the bay where you'll have company. You've got to help me. I want you to... Get in touch with a girl named Alma Biggs. Yeah? You'll find her at the Empire Club out on Geary Street. My name's Reuben Calloway. Tell her about me. She'll pay you for it. What'd she do, collect bodies? Just give her this key. It's for a locker down in the bus station. Now, look, Pop, you don't know me. Suppose I use the key. You can't spend it. You better take the money. All right. Just see, Alma, and tell her it didn't work out. It didn't work out for me at all. I guess that's right, huh? On the big things, you're 100%. I don't need a check. Oh. Here, set up. I told you I don't want you dying in here. Stop, big little fella. You don't have all the bad luck. <laughs> They must have sent a fast chariot, because when I leaned over, the guy was dead. And he was working hard at it, too. He was a skinny little guy, all bent up and twisted in the bottom of the boat like an old paper clip. It wouldn't do any good to straighten him out, because he wasn't going to sleep easy. 
His eyes were open and rolling around at the sky as if he was on the make for a star. And the skin hung loose around his face so that when you touched it, it felt like an empty baked potato. I pushed him into a corner and started for Pier 19. When I got there, I hauled him on the dock and went down to call homicide. Must have been about 8.30 when I took a cab out to the Empire Club. It was a gambling joint out on Geary Street where they cut their whiskey and cards in different rooms. I asked a guy at the window if he knew Alma Biggs, and he pointed her out by the roulette table. She was wearing a white satin evening gown. And as I walked up behind her, I noticed she moved in rhythm with the roulette wheel. It was interesting. If it had been a merry-go-round, they'd have pinched her. I squeezed in next to her at the table, and I was thinking of trying it again when she started to talk. It's a tight fit. Are you sure you like it? I'm not going to stay long. That's what Rudolph Hess said. Make your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Gamblers, make your bets. Stake me, Alma. I can't afford you, darling. Well, go broke for Reuben Calloway, then. Four on the red. Mm, I ought to keep you for luck, darling. Will you comb your hair? I'll take the chips. They'd look bad on Calloway. Oh. It's too crowded here. Let's find a closet. All right. Did he look pretty? For a fish, he was all right. How are you? Pat Novak. I picked him up in the bay. He said to look you up and tell you it didn't work out. Hmm. That would please Turk. Yeah? Who's Turk? The reason it didn't work out. Is that all, Mr. Novak? Except for a key. It fits a bus station locker here. You keep it, Mr. Novak. It won't buy anything. Now, look, sweetheart. I picked up your boy and dried him out, but that's all. We were small friends at best, so the services stopped. You can come to a slow stop for $200. Take the key and pick up what's in that locker. I'll get it from you later. Yeah. I'll meet you in an hour. Where's a good place? Your apartment? Well, it's a place. I'll find it in the book. I hope you don't mind. No, the thin walls will save me. What's in the locker? What would it prove? Proves you've got a small mouth, Angel. Unless you're going to kiss it, don't worry. 9.30 then? All right. I'll bring the 200 with me. Don't worry about the dough. Oh? Because I scooped your chips off the table. See you later. <laughs> She stood there watching me as I walked over to the cashier's window. Oh, she gave you a nice warm feeling like a Bunsen burner in the middle of your back. And as she stood there in the center of the floor smiling, you knew she could turn a glacier into a steam bath at 400 yards. A nice little mouse that made you want to go home and test all the old traps. Well, I cashed in her chips and the boy at the window shoved out 200 rocks in a pained look as if he'd just handed over his right lung. I got a cab and rode down to the bus station at 7th and Market. There were a few people sitting at the counter and a couple of old men on the benches waiting for somebody to get up and leave the funny papers. I went over near the wall and opened up the locker. It was a long trip for a small package. It was a square manila envelope and was an address up in the corner. Reuben Calloway, photographer. I squeezed the envelope and it felt like photographs, but I wasn't sure. I started to close the locker when I turned, and then I tumbled for the first time. It's like getting a drop of rain on your hand before you ever look up at the sky. The two of them were standing over by the cigar counter watching me. A guy with a heavy overcoat and a little small guy about the size of a hangnail. It wouldn't do any good to sit down because I knew they'd stand till somebody condemned the building, so I walked past them out onto the street. There was a cab standing right in front. Cab, mister? Yep. Yeah. Swing up toward the St. Francis, will you? Yeah. Now, look, you're going to be tailed, so brush up on your alleys. If you like it that way. Hey, you were supposed to take a left there on mission. I got a license. Where's yours? I told you to double back over market. Look, get out and walk if you don't like it. I've been bought, mister. Oh, my two friends. That's right. You should have come first. I ought to part your hair. You got more chance with them. Here we are. Where are you going? You like alleys. That's what you're going to get. Yeah. Take it easy, fella. You're not going anywhere. You were nice while you lasted. Take it easy. You better walk up a wall. They'll block the alley. See? Crowded alley, huh? Yeah. Give me the envelope so we can all get out. Can Junior help you? Give me the envelope. <laughs> there. Now, let's see it. 
Yeah, it's still sealed. You all through? I don't know. I'll see. You like him, Joe? No. That's the way it is, mister. He don't like you. <laughs> I slid down like an old sock on a bony leg. I rolled over a couple of times and tried to stand up, but it wasn't easy. You might as well try to find a hair in a bowl of chopped suey. Well, it began to rain, and I figured it'd be easier to float out to the street, so I went to sleep. When I woke up, the rain hadn't helped the alley much. It's like washing your kid's face and finding out he was ugly to start with. The mud had washed up against the walls, and there was a thick, sour smell, and down the alley across the street there was a part of a sign sticking out that said eats. And that isn't what you felt like at all. I started groping around to get up and my hand hit the pictures. They were scattered all over like clothes in a boarding school. I picked them up and started for the street. On the way up in the cab, I got a chance to look at them and they didn't make sense. There were six of them and they were all just about the same. A bunch of mob scenes of that fire over in Oakland. I didn't have time to figure it out because the cab pulled up in front of the St. Francis and I went in to call Alma Biggs and tell her the party was off. Part of that alley must have come with me because when I walked into the lobby, the doorman looked at me as if I'd just blown up a nunnery. I tried the number once, but nobody answered. I decided to wait 20 minutes and call again. That was a mistake because I just got in the booth and started to dial and somebody started rapping on the door with a nickel. It was Hellman from Homicide. Hello, Novak. Come on out. You can't get a date in that suit. What do you want, Hellman? Come on out! Oh, you're a hard man to find. Well, you don't look in the right places. I'm a family man. Tell me about the dead guy. I don't know, Hellman. He died in my boat. That's all I know. He didn't say anything? Just sentimental stuff. His name's Reuben Calloway. Somebody threw him in the bay without instructions. I don't know a thing about him except he takes pictures. Yeah? I'll wipe off the drool. They're not your kind. Who are his friends? He's got new ones by now. I don't know, Hellman. How about that guy up in your couch? Huh? I just left your place. How about that guy on the couch? There's a gal up there, but that's all. Does she wear suspenders? Huh? Then take my word, it's a man. And you're going to tell me he's dead, Hellman? No, I'm not going to tell you he's dead, Novak. He may be a soft breather. <laughs> When Hellman mentioned the step up at my place, I knew we were going to be in low gear the rest of the night because Hellman isn't an easy guy. He wouldn't give his wife an aspirin if she had concussion of the brain. He took me out the side door and we rode up to my apartment. The dead guy was lying on the couch with his arms across his chest as if he wanted somebody to give him a lily or a way out of this. The lamp was shining down on his face and the light was distorted. But when you stood over him, you could see his face with the color of pressed seaweed. If he had anything to be happy about, you couldn't tell. Because his mouth was open and hung over to one side like a loose change purse filled with old teeth. His clothes were rumpled and his shirt was open at his neck. You could see a chain around his neck and a silver medal in the dull light against his chest. It looked out of place and made you feel funny, like seeing a picture of a Madonna in a bowling alley. I watched him while Hellman made noise. He still looks like a man. Yeah? Who is he? George Leggett. What does that prove? Who his mother was? We're checking for a record. The gun, too. What gun? One was lying here on the floor. I want to know if it's the same gun that killed Reuben Calloway. Well, you'll need some prints. Anybody can buy a handkerchief. Where were you tonight? In an alley down near Mission Street. You like it down there? It's all right. You'd like it. I got shoved in and pushed around for these pictures. They don't look like the right kind of pictures. Well, I can't explain that, Hellman. Maybe they took the good ones. How do you fit in? Calloway gave me a key to a locker down on the bus station. It was for a girl named Alma Biggs. And the girl sent you down? That's right, with 200 bucks running money. If you want to know about Calloway, look up a guy named Turk. Turk what? I don't know, Hellman. Maybe he's only got one name. Maybe the other was Stinker. You got a police file? Look him up. The girl mentioned him. That's all I know. We'll look him up. But I'm not going to forget you. One guy's dead on Pier 19. Another up here in your apartment. You mixed up, Novak. There's a connection. I'll shop around till I strike it. You couldn't strike oil on a filling station. You got a double murder shop for a pair of people. I'll shop far enough to get you, big shot. Far enough to see you fry. Well, you got the lard for it, Hellman. <laughs> if you keep your mouth shut now, you can hold in the blood. Oh, uh, Hellman talking. Yeah? Where'd you find out? <laughs> That'd make it easier. You sure the same gun killed them both? Yeah. Yeah, I'll be in. Well? Huh? 
Oh. Wrong number, Novak. They didn't give Helm a sense of humor. They gave him a loud laugh instead. When he walked out of my place, he was smiling like a funny man who's just exposed Santa Claus. I didn't feel very funny myself. I took another look at those pictures, and I was as mixed up as a guy with a Mexican divorce. They were just ordinary pictures of a fire in Oakland. What made them so important? I was sure that Gunsel had taken some pictures, but, well, were they any different than those? And why was Alma Biggs afraid to pick them up? And who was a guy named Turk? I was full of questions, but no answers, like some guy at a peace conference. If I went over it anymore, I'd be counting my toes. So I got out of there and looked up Jocko Madigan. Oh, he's a good guy, and he was a smart one, too, until he decided the only way you can get a good trade-in on hard luck is with a bottle of whiskey. I found him at Emilio's bar, patting Bill, the bartender, on the back with one hand and pouring jiggers of gin with the other. At the table down at Murray's in the place where Louis dwells. Jocko. Ba, ba, ba. Gentlemen, songsters of on a spree, doom from here to its end. Jocko, I want to talk to you. Shh, Patsy, I'm driving a Harvard man crazy. He's at the end of the bar. Well, stop drinking and listen to me. I've got to keep on drinking, Patsy, if I want to preserve any continuity in my life, because I don't drink to forget, but rather to remember. To remember all the pleasant events of my life. Uh, there were two of them, I think. All right, Jocko. The first was a girl I met many twilights ago, and the second was a summer night in St. Louis when a bartender felt crazed with the heat and set him up on the house. Will you stop it? I'm in trouble. Memory is a blessed toy, Patsy. But you have to be careful because it can be dangerous, like uh, giving a rifle to a small child for Christmas. It's true he can get some temporary pleasure out of it by shooting various neighbors, but sooner or later he's going to kill the only rich relative in the family. Jocko, I'm tired. And memory is the same way. So you're entitled to collect the few good ones you have. You're allowed to straighten them out and put them in order. After all, an old pool ball gets racked now and then. You all through? Yes. I've run out of memories. Hellman thinks I killed two guys ten miles apart. Wasn't it difficult? The same murder gun. The whole thing is tied up with some pictures. In uh, color? A guy by the name of Reuben Calloway died in my boat. He gave me a key to a locker downtown. The pictures were there. Is that one of them? Yeah, take a look. Oh, if it's a group picture, they were a very unruly family. It's the Oakland Fire. Two Gunsels followed me and took some of the pictures. In the meantime, some guy got shot in my place. Everybody's after the pictures. Why? Have you seen the other pictures? No, I took an intermission. That's why you got to help. Now, you'll find Reuben Calloway's address in the phone booth. Get up there and go through his stuff, will you? It doesn't sound legal. Neither's a bum murder rap. Get up there and go through his pictures. Try to find anything that'll fit in with his set. Where are you going besides jail? I got to find a gal named Alma Biggs. Oh, you'll have trouble with a name like that. She's probably changed it. The locker key was tabbed for her, but she hired me to run her errands. Is she pretty? Yes, if you like a fast track. Now get up there, Jocko. Why can't I see her? Will you stop it, Jocko? Just get up there. Forget about her. She'd scare you to death. Yes. Well, at least I'd die hopeful. Good night, lover. <laughs> Finding Alma Biggs was quite a job. I knew she was around, but I couldn't get to her. It was like trying to get a peanut shell out of a back tooth. I called the Empire Club, but they didn't know anything about her. I went through all the phone books and the city directories, and I didn't get anything but a sore thumb. And I didn't do any better with the hotels. I sat in lupos and called them all one by one, and by one o'clock I knew more desk clerks than a vice squad cop, but no Alma Biggs. Finally, I went out to the Empire Club and started talking to the cabbies. About 15 minutes later, one pulled up and remembered taking a girl in a satin evening gown up to an apartment on the hill. I called Hellman and rode up there to check the names. Alma Biggs had an apartment on the second floor. I knocked on the door and she didn't answer, so I tried it. The lights were out, so I closed the door and groped over to the desk. I should have noticed the draperies as I passed because they were full of people. Wait a minute. All right, now. Wait a minute, Mr. Nilfax. Stop breaking things. Someday you may want to mend me. Uh, do you always sleep in the curtains? Do you always talk this long in the dark? 
Turn on the light. Yeah. I wanted to see who you were. George Leggett, maybe. Oh? Do you know him? We're roommates. He died on my couch tonight. Anything serious or just humdrum death? He's satisfied. What do you know about him? Well, I never heard anybody say a bad thing about him. Of course, I never heard anybody mention him. Now, look, Angel, it's late. Who's George Leggett? Why do you care? Because homicide cares. They got Calloway and Leggett back to back, and they want my skin. Mm, it's a nice skin, darling. Where the pictures? Unless you're a social worker, you're not going to like them here. Let me see. They're not all here. Yeah, I figured that. Where are the other pictures, Patsy? In some Ghanoff's album. Two of them jumped me down near Mission Street. Who are they? We never got that friendly. Well, there couldn't have been two of them. Well, maybe the little guy was just window dressing, but he gave the right answers. Patsy, I think you're a liar. You're nicer than homicide. I want those pictures. You do. I'm going to take them away from you. Well, if I had them, that's a big enough gun to do it. Get the pictures, Patsy. It's a bad time for murder, Angel. Homicide's working this week. I haven't time, Patsy. I'll push you down like a blade of grass. Get the pictures. Now, look, sweetheart. I took a job for 200 bucks. It covers a tandem murder rap and a sapping down on Mission Street, but it won't cover big talk from you. Now, put the gun away or I'll bend you hard. Don't move up when you talk. You're around behind. Come on, give it to me. Up it, Patsy. Feels good. Let it go or take the pain. Drop it. Go. You don't have to hang on. I'm not a barbell. You're handy now. Who's Turk? Stop it. You're hurting my arm. There's a guy named Turk. I want to know who he is. You're late for that. Who is he? Go ahead. Tear it off. You'll die ignorant. Yeah. You sound blue, Novak. Oh, what do you want, Hellman? I want to give you a reason. We got the coroner's report on George Leggett. Yeah? He died in your apartment. The blood off your carpet looks good on these slides. All right, so the murderer sold me the rug. So what, Hellman? So we ran down George Leggett's record. A Detroit gunman who got out here six weeks ago. Yeah? He traveled for years with a guy named Turk Spaniel. Now, that's your boy. You better find him. We already have. Don't tell me he's up on the couch. He was born too soon for you. We checked with the Detroit police. What'd they say? They know all about Turk Spaniel. He was killed nine years ago in West Detroit. But they found the guy that did it and sent him up to Lansing for life. Yeah? Yeah. He was a guy named Joe Biggs. Say hello to your girlfriend. Well, I didn't talk to the girl because I knew she'd close up faster than a Dublin meat market on Friday. I left her and went down to the Chronicle morgue to find out what I could about Turk Spaniel. Hellman had covered it. Spaniel talked too much, and Joe Biggs killed him and left him growing out of a ditch like an old weed. I didn't know where to turn now. With the Turk gone, who was after those pictures besides Alma Biggs, and what did they prove? I knew the answer was there. Probably in plain sight, like a blimp on a football field, but I couldn't get near it. It was past two when I got back to my apartment and the phone was screaming for help. Yeah. Hello, Patsy. This is Jocko. What'd you find out? That Callaway was quite a photographer. Yeah? You should see some of the pictures. Ooh, I'm in love with you. All right, Jocko. Did you find anything? There's a check for a thousand dollars from Alma Bates. Yeah, what else? Some more pictures of the Oakland Fire. One of them looks good. Yeah? It's just like the rest, except in the background, something is circled with a red pencil. That'll do it, Jocko. And there's a clipping here with another picture. I can't tell, but I think they match. What's it say? Well, it's all about... Jocko, what's the matter? Are you all right, Jocko? Jocko, you all right? He says to tell you no. <laughs> After Jocko's call, I grabbed a cab and rode up to Calloway's apartment. When I got there, Jocko was sitting in the middle of the floor as sad as a steer on a sheep ranch. He hadn't seen who hit him, and the picture was gone, so was the clipping. I asked him if there were any negatives around. He said no. That meant that somebody was still on the prowl for those negatives. So I called Hellman and briefed him. He said he'd meet us at Reuben Calloway's studio in ten minutes. When we got there, it was dark, but I sensed Hellman in the back room. Turned out to be a couple of pans of acid, but Hellman was there going over the negatives. All this guy did was take pictures. Let me take a look, will you, Hellman? Can you spot the right one here, Jocko? Hold them up to the light. All right. Here are the fire pictures. Uh, how about this one? No, no, I had that one. Yeah, that's it. And, and this fellow back here is the one that was circled. Hold it up so I can see. Hello, Turk. You waited too long. Give me the picture, mister. All that gun will do is make noise, Spaniel. It won't make enough to keep a secret. 
Just hand me the picture. Somebody knows you're alive now. The picture's for laughs. It's your word against mine. And I'll be so far away I can't hear the argument. Let's have it. Don't give it to him, Novak. Yeah, I'll give it to him. You take it away, Hellman. Thanks, Novak. That alley taught you manners. Just stand over there. I want to remember the way you looked. Don't worry. I'll tell you about them, Turk. Uh, you keep backing into this gun, it's going to show around your breastbone. The guns are getting cheap. You better drop yours, Spaniel. Over there. Hmm. You look the same, Turk, or almost the same. You got this all wrong, Alma. Joe doesn't look the same. Nine years in the cooler and you lose your personality. Please, Alma, don't do anything crazy. After nine years, you lose almost everything. Joe's lost everything but me. Down on the floor, Spaniel. I want you on your knees. Please. Alma, you got it wrong. I got it all right, Turk. Because Joe wouldn't lie to me. When he said he didn't kill you, I knew you were alive. Please, Alma. Down on the floor beside the table. Go easy, baby. You got a copper here. I can't hurt him, Novak. Turk Spaniel's legally dead. All you can do to a dead man is kick up the dust. Please, Alma. You're not seeing this right. I'm going to have a better chance than you. You couldn't see, Spaniel. You couldn't see your way back to help Joe out. You look good on your knees. Over by the table. Leave that asshole alone, sweetheart. I'm going to help him see. With a whole pan full of it. I'm going to help you see, Spaniel. Please. Please, Alma. You wouldn't do that. You got the short end of the bat. You better look at him, Jocko. Don't bother unless you're a baby doctor. We may need you, lady. Not for this copper. Remember, Turk Spaniel's dead. Detroit says so. He looks live now. He can't be dead there and live here. I like your climate, but it's not that good. You can't see me, Turk. But I'll bet you can hear me walk out of here. Goodbye, Turk. I'll send you a cane. Hellman managed to get most of the story out of Turk Spaniel. Reuben Calloway stumbled into the whole thing and he didn't know what hit him. He went over to Oakland to take some pictures of the fire and he got a picture of Spaniel in the crowd. Spaniel saw him and trailed him over to this side. He had to get the pictures because back in Detroit he'd framed Joe Biggs with a riddled up body and skipped out of the country. He'd been away until a few weeks ago and now he was waiting for a boat out of San Francisco, so he had to stay dead. He sent George Leggett after the pictures, but Leggett figured it was a good way to double-cross him and stay in the clear, so he tipped off Alma Biggs, who'd come out here on a lead a few weeks before. Turk finally tumbled. With a local gunsel, he killed Calloway and left Leggett in my apartment where he trailed him. <laughs> it almost worked out, but he didn't get to that shop in time. Well, Hellman asked only one question. When I first met her, did I know that Alma Biggs was that hard? No. In that satin evening gown, I didn't think so. American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the fifth of a new series, Pat Novak, For Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Rousseau. Jack O'Manigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Edlin. In our cast were Yvonne Fady, Charles McGraw, Herb Butterfield, and Herb Ellis. This program is being released to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations, we will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. Now, a brief reminder. There is no mystery to this statement wherever they serve at home or abroad.
The men who wear the uniform of the United States are men of whom we can be proud. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. All of them serve our country and us with pride and honor. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.